All right, good morning, everyone. We're going to return to the regular agenda, and we will start uh, with a report on items discussed in closed session. Thank you, Madam Chair. There were no reportable actions from closed session today. Thank you. So we're moving now to item eight, which is oral communications. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the commission on items that are not on today's agenda. Uh, we ask that you please uh, state your name clearly so that it can be accu accurately recorded in the minutes. So please. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Ted Frank Rimdy. I've got a nickname, so I'll start with that. I'm from, uh, from Watsonville. And uh, I've been following the news uh, of uh, the progress of the rail trail, and I've, I've uh, determined that there's a there's a lot of uh, skepticism having to do with the rail and the affordability of the of the rail part of it. And uh, quite frankly, I have my own concerns on that end of it too. <laughs> but I, I probably won't live long enough to see see the end result. But uh, how about that develops? So I'm going to make a, a proposal that a study be undertaken, uh, if it's not already started, uh, to uh, to establish a, a scenic railway in conjunction with the commuter railway. Uh, it would be privately funded, in my estimation, to make it more effective and. Uh, um, well, more flexible, let me put it that way. Uh, the idea of a scenic railway isn't unique, as you know. There's uh, Bruce. Uh, there's other um, 770 scenic railways in the United States, all of them uh, doing quite well for, by uh, my observation. And uh, I think we have an outstanding scenic corridor along the coastline and uh, and even in inland and we certainly have attractions from the standpoint of of uh, the redwood forests and the, the sea and a lot of variety uh, there's no doubt in my mind that there, this a scenic railway would be a tremendous uh, attraction a uh, commercial attraction uh, one that would could fund a, a large part of the railway so that's that was what I wanted to Say, just uh, look into it. I, I, I suggest that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any additional comments in chambers today? Hi, good morning. My name is Catherine Parker. I had not planned to speak, but talking to people, I thought it, I understand that there's a, um, a lot of different committees involved and there, originally there was a like a walkers committee um, now there is a, an elderly and disabled transportation committee but not a specific walkers committee and I was wondering if we could reinstate that thank you thank you any further comments yes please come on come on up to the podium if you have any comments today Morning. Hi. Um, I, I, Susanna Glina, um, Capitola. Um, I just kind of want to back up what the two previous speakers have said. Um, there's many people that use the trail already, um, the way that it is as walkers, and the experience of a walker is very different than one who rides a bicycle or is on a train. Um, the aesthetics, the tree coverage, you know, just the experience is completely different. And so, once again, um, if we could get some sort of backing for a committee that is addressing the aesthetics of a trail that is used by people that are going at a completely different speed. Thank you. Last call for comments here in the room. All right. Do we have any public comment online? Looks like we have a couple. We'll start with Mr. Peoples. Thank you. This is Brian Peoples with Trail Now. We're uh, thousand supporters, local supporters to build the trail now. 
um, a cost-effective, timely, and eco-friendly manner. We actually supported 2016 Measure B. We actually came out opposed to it originally because they had 24% of the funding going to a train and uh, the commission changed language, so we supported it and that helped drive it. Uh, we need to get the coastal corridor open as quickly as possible. Only one mile has been built in a decade and at a cost of $25 million per mile for a 12 foot wide trail, that's not acceptable. Um, segment 7B is a great example of a substandard trail that's costing too much. The North Coast Trail has been delayed for years and it's doubled the cost now. They're finally moving forward. Uh, there was a lot of uh, political push in the way that there's never gonna be a train to Davenport. And actually, um, Commissioner Schifferin actually went to and had a private meeting with Guy Press and former and asked for Roaring Camp to be allowed to have a their train taxpayer funded tourist train. And we all remember the the nightmare when Iowa Pacific first started the tourist train up on the west side. Huge cries of complaints about the noise. The tourist train up the north did not work. But back to Mr. Schiffner, we feel that he has business practices. We actually know, we have some information on it, that he has a conflict of interest, and that's why he's promoting Roaring Camp to have a uh, tourist train. And we feel that an investigation be made on that. We actually have some information on that. So it's very concerning that Mr. Schiffner continues to push for Roaring Camp to have the rights of the railroad track. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. We'll go now to Ben Vernazza. Okay. Mr. Uh, what I want to do is to uh, read two requirements for a class one <clears throat> trail and then ask Caltrans to uh, confirm that this is true uh, to, to you and to the staff. Uh, first, width. The minimum width requirement between structures, buildings, walls, Sir? fences, posts. Mr. Venez, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Are, you. are you referring to item 29 on today's agenda? Uh, well, I'll actually talk with uh, Caltrans and ask them on 27. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm, I didn't know I had the hand up. Thank you. Oh, my apologies. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's in the Caltrans report then. Thank you. Uh, my, Mr. Michael Saint. Uh, good morning, Chair Brown and commissioners. Um, my screen as well as the audio didn't work the first half hour of this meeting. Uh, so I missed anything before you went into closed session. I'm wondering, Chair Brown, if it would be uh, appropriate to comment on item six, uh, CFST litigation. Is that possible? Uh, that was in our closed session item, sir. I know, but uh, since I'm part of that, I just wanted to just make a few comments. Uh, I wanted to do it during the actual agenda item, but unable. I did call for public comment before closed session. It wasn't around your video, nor your audio was working. <clears throat> Okay. All right. Go ahead, sir. Okay. I would really uh, like to emphasize that uh, you take the litigation seriously. We have also partnered with the Sierra Club as a co-litigator. Uh, please remember our success in the previous litigation and getting the Tier 1 EIR set aside and voided. Also, this segment number 12 Oxlane uh, was not part of the original Measure D vote, so the Aptos residents uh, didn't get to vote on this section as well as those in the segment 12 area. Uh, Aptos residents uh, feel uninformed and not included. The first time some have heard of this portion of the Oxlane project was from CFST's outreach in Aptos or when county employees uh, notify them of their pr properties will be affected. Um, even though we have public comment, we still feel ignored and frustrated. Our outreach on segment 12 is spreading and we hope you will take the litigation again very seriously. And unlike Caltrans, Aptos residents 
are open to alternatives to highway widening. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional public comment? Seeing none, uh, we'll bring it back. And we're going to say something since I was uh, briefly, attacked very briefly, sir. Um, I am supportive. Commissioner Schifrin, I'm sorry to interrupt. Would you please turn on your mic? And we also do have an item for commissioner reports if you'd like to continue the comments at that time. No, I just would repeat, um, usually we don't allow personal attacks in the, at the meeting, uh, but since the one, one was made about me, I just want to be clear that while I support the, a recreational train up to Davenport, if it becomes feasible, and it is included in the North Coast Facilities Plan. I have no economic relationship with uh, Roaring Camp Railroad whatsoever and no conflict of interest. Thank you. We're going to move now to our consent agenda. Uh, is there any uh, member of the commission that has any comments, questions, wants to pull any item on the consent agenda? Seeing none, do we have any public comment on our consent agenda? Seeing none in the room, any online? Oh, I'm sorry. Welcome. Jim Helmer, Ben Lohman. Is the Highway 9 uh, speed limit setting on the consent agenda? Thank you. <clears throat> I'd first like to uh, commend RTC staff, Brianna Goodman, for an excellent job of touring, um, checking dense land use densities, driveway locations, uh, existing conditions, excellent job, and also Deputy Director Luis Mendez, who personally walked through Ben Loman, spoke to Ben Loman business owners about speed limits. My main point is that um, in all of my communications with Caltrans, they rely on the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, the MUTCD. The 11th edition of the MUTCD was just produced in December of last year, and it's been 15 years since the last update. This edition is what Caltrans should be using when setting speed limits in rural towns on state highways. It says they strongly encourage um, every safety factor when setting speed limits, such as sight distance, walkability, foot traffic, driveways, densities. Um, they also make the statement that um, any roadway death or serious injury is unacceptable. They talk about <clears throat> proactivity has to be a stronger consideration than reactivity. So I would just remind Caltrans to use the 11th edition just published in making their determination on speed limits on state highways, and I'd highly recommend they use the authority that they've been vested in the passage of AB 43. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment here in the room? Seeing none, any online? Yes. I'm, I'm gonna bring it back to the uh, commission after public comment, which is right now. Seeing no further public comment, <laughs> Commissioner Rotkin. Mr. Helmer raised the question about the speed limits on Highway 9, effectively. Um, there are two ways, apparently, and this is what I want to ask staff, and Caltrans as well, two ways to set traffic speeds when the traffic seems to be going too fast. And one of them is using the authority under the bill that he mentioned to just go ahead and set that traffic speed at a certain level. The other, I don't know if any of you have been through this at your local jurisdictions, but it's absurd which is remove the existing traffic speed limit, but open it up to people going faster and then figure out how many people go faster and then you only, there's a bunch of complicated percentages of how many people going how fast allows you to then bring the speed limit back down again. The people look at you like you're completely nuts. I mean, we're trying to slow the traffic down and you just changed it from 25 to 45 or 35 or whatever. 
So I don't know what uh, authority we have. I mean, it's probably just to recommend to Caltrans that they think about this. But I think we should, in effect, you know, avoid that absurd, it is absurd process by which the only way you can reset a speed limit is to let people go faster for like six months and study how, how many, how fast they go and whether anybody gets killed. I mean, and that's gratuitous, the last comment, but, but how fast people go. And um, I think it'd be much better to avoid that if in fact Caltrans has the authority to look at how, what the traffic speed is and what its impacts are. We should encourage that rather than this other absurd thing, which always makes the public body look Crazy because you, we asked for you to slow the traffic down, and the first thing you did was increase the speed limit. Thanks. Move the consent agenda. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Did we catch the second? There's a tie between many people. <laughs> Anyone want to? I'll take it. Okay. <laughs> We're all very eager today. Um, okay, uh, with that, we have no one online, so we'll do a voice vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. We'll move on now to item 25, which is commissioner reports. Do we have any oral? Yes, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd also like to kind of echo what Andy said about, you know, there really is no place for personal attacks when you think about decorum um, in public meetings. I thought it was kind of a cheap shot. The second thing, while we're talking about decorum, you know, at the last meeting I was a little bit troubled because there were, you know, there was a tussle at the podium. I think everybody saw that. The police had to be called twice, which I had to do because it was at Scotts Valley. And, you know, there was also kind of, I don't know if you noticed it, but there was like an intimidation and in your face of one of the members who was trying to speak by a public person just trying to intimidate. And it really has no place uh, in, in a meeting. We have a pretty good, I mean, we have a lot of people from different backgrounds here. And I think we have a good record or tradition of, uh, of respect. And I would like to see that continue, if that's okay. I agree. Thank you. Any additional uh, commissioner reports? All right. Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to our Caltrans report. Ms. Ryder, hello. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, my apologies. I, I hope that's not an indication that my reports are going. Oh, my long. gosh. <laughs> oh, I skipped over you. My apology. <laughs> Director's uh, report. Uh, well, I'll make it brief. No. Um, I'll go slow so everybody can appreciate it. Uh, first of all, um, I, I would just reiterate uh, what Commissioner Johnson said about the importance of decorum for people in the audience. I mean, some of it we observed and some of it, um, you know, somebody sent a screenshot of the video of, of, of someone definitely, uh, you know, it looked from that really working to intimidate a commissioner. Um, I spoke to that individual. I spoke to the individual who has the podium. Uh, we should not tolerate that and will not tolerate that. So I think we, as, as was said here a couple of times, we need to respect that everybody has a difference of opinion. We may not agree with that, whether it's in the in the audience or you know uh, here or or virtually, and, but just behave appropriately and recognizing that that you know that all opinions are value, and even if it's not yours. So I'd appreciate that by people. Um, and now I'll go into my normal long winding of the report. Uh, on April 26th, Federal Highway Administration Central Federal Lands Division awarded a 32 million dollar contract to Albanese Incorporated for construction of Segment 5 of the Mon Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail, including parking lots at Davenport and Yellow Bank Panther Beach. The current total project cost is $51.4 million, of which RTC is contributing $8.5 million in Measure D funds. The contract to implement the environmental mitigation for the project is expected to go out to bid this summer. We will provide an update on the project construction schedule and any updates regarding the cost estimates for environmental mitigation at our June RTC meeting. Uh, earlier this week, the County Board of Supervisors voted unanimously to enter into Caltrans and CTC baseline agreement to receive their previously awarded $67.6 million in state active transportation program funding for final design and construction of segments 10 and 11 
of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail. This project is expected to move forward into final design of the ultimate trail configuration this summer or fall. As discussed at our April 18th meeting, staff is actively seeking additional funding for this project, including a federal raise grant, a federal earmark, and staff is currently preparing a federal active transportation improvement program application. Uh, staff uh, would ask that elected officials in support of the project reach out to our federal representatives to express that support. On Sunday, April 21st, RTC staff participated in the Watsonville Earth Day celebration. Staff shared information about the Go Santa Cruz County program, RTC projects, bike routes, Metro's free transit service, and collected information from the public on critical transportation needs for the Regional Transportation Plan and the Equity Action Plan. Yesterday, Santa Cruz County Bike Month kicked off. Along with our partners at Ecology Action, we invite everyone to join the online challenge to bike more and drive less. Participants can take part in Walk and Bike to School Day or join a community bike ride or other special events. The RTC provides some Transportation Development Act funds to Ecology Action to support Bike Month. You can visit our website and sign up for the Bike Month Challenge. I would also like to make commissioners aware of a recent state budget action which may have impact locally. On Monday, the State Department of Finance directed state departments with one-time general fund appropriations in 2021, 2022, or 2023 to immediately cease spending those funds unless those funds are covered by a handful of exceptions. This could impact funds received through the Transit and Industry Rail Capital Program and the Active Transportation Program. We have reached out to the appropriate state agencies and are waiting to hear back about uh, the impact this freeze will have on the uh, aforementioned programs. Lastly, I would uh, like that to ask the commission to approve resolutions recognizing two staff members who have reached significant milestones in their careers with RTC. Rachel Morricone has had her 25 year anniversary and Luis Mendez's 30 year anniversary. Uh, you know, I've uh, had the pleasure of working with Rachel, you know, probably, I don't know, close to 18 of those 25 years uh, at, when I was at, with the state. And I can tell you she uh, is very knowledgeable, well-respected, and uh, people at the state value her input. I, I talked to one of my colleagues who, who was a legislative staffer, and when he was working on, on bills and wanted to know how they would really impact people, he would count on. Rachel to tell him the impact that it would really have, not just who it, you know, if it benefits Santa Cruz, but really be honest about it. And she was also a tireless advocate for Santa Cruz County. Uh, Luisa had the opportunity to work with when uh, the RTC purchased the, the rail line. Uh, and uh, s since uh, coming here, I've had the opportunity to work with him obviously much more and I've really grown to respect and appreciate the, the tremendous knowledge that he brings uh, to every issue that comes before us. So uh, I would ask the, the commission to approve uh, resolutions uh, recognizing them for their service. Thank you. That was a good report, and I'm glad we didn't skip over it. <laughs> Commissioner Schifrin. Um, I have a legal question about being able to approve things that are not on the agenda. I totally support the resolutions, but that I think they need to be put on our next agenda, um, consent agenda for action. At least they're not on the list of If they are proclamations, then they can be approved by the council without being on the agenda, by the commission. If they are Resolutions, they should come back on the consent calendar. They're proclamations. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, then I'd certainly be happy to move that we approve the proclamations for both Rachel I'll second. Mendes and uh, 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 Luis Mendez. <laughs> All right. We have a motion and a second to approve the proclamations. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. And I wanted to say, some, uh, say something about segment five. Com Commissioner Schiffrin, would you mind speaking close into the mic so that folks ca at home can hear? Thank you. Segment five um, 
is is going to be a uh, rail trail from Wilder Ranch to Davenport. If anybody has ever tried to ride their bike and is not a complete uh, athlete, uh, it's terrifying. To do, it was terrifying for me to do that on Highway One. This is going to be an enormously important link in terms of providing pedestrians and bicyclists the ability to get from uh, Wilder to uh, Davenport. It can become, you know, it, it is frustrating how long projects like this take. However, what's really amazing about this project is that when it was first proposed and we got the initial federal flap grant, it was only from uh, Wilder Ranch to Laguna Creek. It didn't go all the way to uh, Davenport. Our staff worked with the, sta uh, the federal agency. They were supportive. And it, then we got... Uh, approval to have the grant go all the way from Wilder to Davenport. But the funding wasn't going to be available until 2026. And uh, because of the tireless work of RTC staff, particularly Grace Blakesley, um, that was, uh, and the support from the federal agency, it was possible to move that money up uh, given the importance of the project. So I, I think it really um, is an exciting start to see this uh, seven-mile construction of the trail from Wilder to Davenport, which is going to be a great public amenity for years to come. And I really wanted to thank uh, all of the um, RTC staff that's worked on this, but particularly, Gra particularly Grace, because the details would just kill you if you really had to, had to go through each and every one of them. And she hung in there. Uh, despite opposition, despite innumerable problems uh, with getting through Coastal Commission approval, working with the farmers, working with state parks, which was a really helpful partner. And I think that today we're starting to, or we soon will start to see the benefits of all that effort. So thank you, Grace. Thank you. All right, do we have any public comment on the director's report? Seeing none in the room, do we have any online? Yes, Mr. Peoples. Yes, this is oh, Brian Peoples. Oh, my apologies. Down. Can you hear me? Yes, so um, Come back. I thank the executive director for the, taking the action um, from the last Scotts Valley meeting. I pointed it out. I was actually threatened, um, and a commissioner on the RTC was threatened. Um, and it was unacceptable. And I, and honestly, the executive director actually witnessed it and he did take action. So I, we appreciate that. And uh, uh, as far as uh, Schiffner, sorry if I, I put you on the spot and I will not uh, comment on that. But having said that, one of the big issues is the many of the commissioners actually incite the anger when they do editorials and they write uh, editorials that truly aren't true. They make comments in the editorials that incite the public, and then the public shows up. I got first got involved with this organization 25 years ago. So I've been involved in this transportation element for a long, long time because I believe we need transportation. So it's a two-way street, and if you continue to publicly outside of this forum make false claims, yeah, you're going to incite anger. And then finally on segment five, you know, that has been totally wrong in the sense of the Coastal Commission didn't even approve a permanent trail. The trail up by Davenport is actually considered a temporary trail because of the armory, the retaining wall that's required because you refuse to pull the old railroad tracks or basically are buried because you want to have a, a tourist train. You want the public to pay for a tourist train. So that kind of policy incites uh, a lot of uh, uh, people getting mad and the farmers were really pissed about all of it. So anyways, so again, thank you, bye. Thank you. All right, we will return to comments in the room real quick. My apologies for kind of racing through that, slow it down. Thank you. 
I'd like to comment on the proclamation for Luis Mendez. Uh, Luis is an incredible asset to the Regional Transportation Commission. He brings really thoughtful, strategic approaches to making recommendations to the RTC. His guidance through complex projects has been the compass that staff looks to often. He is certainly the best mentor anyone could ever ask for. So I just wanted to thank Luis for the effort and commitment you've invested in moving transportation projects forward and always being supportive of our staff. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, with that, I'll bring it back to the commission. Are there any comments on the director's report? Yes. Well, Commissioner Brown. I, I just want to say that um, the combined experience <laughs> of uh, Rachel Morconi and Luis Mendez um, here, I just I think it's it's really um, incredible to have staff who have, have been on board, have seen and kind of seen this this organization through the significant changes that we've gone through moving from a planning agency to a project delivery agency um, with all of the complexity that uh, entails. And so I, I just want to say thank you so much for your work. It's, you know, I, I can't tell you how valuable I, I see it in, in, for this organization. Further comments on the director's report? No? Okay. All right. Uh, seeing none, we will now go to the Caltrans report. Hello. Good morning, Commissioners. Brandy Ryder, Deputy District Director for Planning and Local Assistance in for Caltrans District 5. Um, before I start my announcements, I just wanted to also reiterate how awesome it has been for me personally to work with both Luis and Rachel over the years. Um, as a new planner coming into things, they were really great partners to work with. And uh, Luis taught me a lot of stuff early on about overall work programs, and so I really appreciate both of their experience and expertise. They're a wonderful partner to work with, and I look forward to continuing to work with them. Uh, so with that, I wanted to have a couple of announcements. The first one, um, starting this last Monday, April 29th, Caltrans opened the twice daily convos on Highway 1 through the Rocky Creek slipout to all members of the public and traveling, of the traveling public. The convoys will run from 7 to 8 and 5 to 6 each day. Highway 1 will re continue to be closed at Rocky Creek, Rocky Creek the remainder of the day so that the crews can continue the repair work to stay on schedule to reopen the roadway by Memorial Day. I know this has been a concern for a lot of the traveling public, so we're making these announcements related to that particular slip out. Um, additionally, Caltrans offices throughout California are hosting their annual worker memorial ceremonies during the last month of April and currently in the month of May to honor our fallen coworkers who gave the ultimate sacrifice while serving the state of California. This is an important opportunity to honor their service, but also remind the traveling public to be aware that the highways are our field offices and to practice safe driving while driving through work zones on the highway system. Our district hosted our worker memorial this last Tuesday, honoring eight Central Coast Caltrans employees that lost their lives since 1910. And with that, I can entertain any questions that you might have. Thank you. Any questions from commissioners? Seeing none, uh, we will go now to any public comment on the Caltrans report. Any in the room? Seeing none, we will go online. Uh, and I see uh, Mr. Peoples. Oh, I'm sorry, Ben Vernaza. Yes, yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> first of all, I, I want to ask Caltrans some questions. But first, I want to say the environmental report has nothing about safety, but Caltrans does. For instance, the width, the minimum width requirement between structure, buildings, walls, fences, posts for a class one path is 14 feet including a 10-foot usable paved trail with two-foot shoulders. Used, so that means it's usable of 10, and that's the minimum. That's on uh, part uh, bikeway highway design or bikeway design criteria 1003.1, item three. Second question, accessibility. I understand reading the, the design requirements if the path is intended for shared use between pedestrians and bikes, it must be accessibly 
uh, standards outlined by the Department of Industrial Relations Division of DIB. That's for elderly and disabled uh, persons. And I think that's something that, that needs to be done with Caltrans and staff to evaluate the ultimate travel. And uh, third, uh, Mr. Rockton brought, brought up speed. I think there are some speed uh, maximums uh, in the uh, standards, uh, but that should be looked in also by uh, Caltrans and report back to the commission as well as the staff. Uh, and I'd like to be included and in the staff uh, office has my email. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any additional public comments on the Caltrans report? Seeing none, we'll bring it back. Oh, yes. Seeing none, we'll bring it back to commissioners. Any additional questions or comments? No? All right. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll move on now to item 28, uh, which is a presentation from Capitola Public Works. Morning, Kailash. Good to see you. Morning, Chair and, and Commissioners. Uh, welcome all to Capitola. It's, it's nice to have you here once a year. So uh, happy to pr uh, provide a quick presentation on uh, the projects that we've been working on over the last year that we completed, some things that are underway, and to touch on a couple items that are uh, here in the future. Uh, next slide, please. I guess I didn't introduce myself. My name is Kailash Mazumder. I work with the City of Capitola Public Works Department as the project manager for our capital projects. Okay. All right. Um, here's a quick overview of the projects that we've completed, uh, projects underway for 2024, and then our future projects. And we will go through these now and kind of touch on the highlights for some of these projects for you to uh, see what we've been going on for the last few years here in Capitola. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the first project we wanted to highlight was the Kennedy Drive sidewalk project. This was a, a nice project that infilled a component of our sidewalk network, um, allowing better use of that area down to New Brighton Beach and also for students coming to and from uh, New Brighton Middle School. So this was funded through the RTIP and was completed this last uh, May and June. Um, and we were able to squeeze this in also in conjunction with the uh, execution of the Pure Water Sakel project, which has the new pipeline going in there. So we got the new sidewalk in there and the final striping will be done here as soon as the final uh, restoration for that so project is complete. Uh, next slide, please. Here we have the Capitol Hall Road Rehabilitation Project. This was a, a, a fun project to work with the RTC staff. We had a lot of engagement with the E&D TAC, the bicycle TAC, um, and had a lot of good input and working together to identify the improvements that we could make for pedestrians with curb ramps improvements and um, better striping for bicycles, and then actually a little bit of improvements to circulation at that intersection. Intersections are real hard projects to get after when you're doing road work because creates quite a bit of disruption to the community. So um, being able to complete this intersection has been something that's been in the works for a long time now. So that was that was a great project to have completed and we were able to finish the paving from uh, that intersection at 41st and Capitola Road all the way to city limits at uh, Capitola Road and 30th. Uh, again, this project was funded through Measure D as well as through RTIP funding, SB1, and then uh, city general funds. Uh, we had a drone flight where our police department was able to capture the final striping after it was completed, so we got a nice picture of that project there. Uh, next slide, please. Here we have a project that's underway that we hope to be executing later this summer. This is the upper village and uh, parking lot pedestrian path that will uh, take you out of the parking lot. Many of you may be parked in this this morning. Um, we have in the, on the picture on the left, you can see 
especially during our summer months or anytime it's really sunny in Capitola, we get quite a bit of visitors here. And this major uh, parking lot has pedestrian pathways both up towards Monterey and then also down to Capitola Avenue. Um, pedestrians that often go this way, we end up with somewhat of a squeeze on challenging between uh, by, uh, vehicles and pedestrians. And so we wanted to provide this pathway to provide a separation and allow easier use and access to this parking lot. Uh, the project is design has been completed and will be going out to bid here in the next couple weeks. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this project here we have is the Bay Hill Intersection Pedestrian Safety Quick Build. This is the, at the intersection next to the Knob Hill Shopping Center. Uh, we did quite a bit of public outreach and we gained input from different user groups and the local businesses to identify ways that we could improve this intersection to provide better pedestrian visibility and safety, effectively shortening the uh, crossing distance for pedestrians um, and doing a lane diet to allow that to happen with kind of focusing on safety as the as the main factor here that we wanted to design for. And doing this as a quick build project just because um, we haven't, this intersection has been a point of uh, concern for a long time now and not knowing exactly what the final build out should be. We've we thought approaching it from this standpoint would allow us to gain a lot of good feedback from the community in advance of developing it. Then we can implement it for a short period of time and during that duration, gain more feedback from the community as to what the final build out could be. Uh, it could be hardscaping this uh, project or, or maybe reconsidering what that uh, project might look like. So this will be a project again that we should be able to it out to bid later this summer and, and have it realized hopefully before the coming school year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this one is a, was a fun project that hopefully everyone's aware of. This is, again, since this is uh, Bike to Work Month, or uh, we've got, we were able to launch our B-Cycle component of the Regional Bike Share Program last month here in Capitola. Um, this project is been a, a great collaboration between the RTC, the counties, the cities, um, and, and all the different jurisdictions, as well as the different departments of planning, public works, um, to identify the need areas, the best locations suited for the B-Cycle program. And um, now that it's underway, we're getting to see people traveling around through Capitola between the county um, and, and the city to utilize these, this resource, which is, seems to be really like well used. And I don't have data yet for how much it's been used in Capitola, but just seeing them moving and disappearing from the different docks, we know that they're definitely getting used and we'll, well, I'm sure we'll have metrics here soon. And it's, it's exciting to hear about, and I think pretty, pretty good value too. I think the, the annual subscription, I think is nearly like $150. So it's a pretty good deal for people wanting to get around using e-bikes and, and the placement of them throughout the community has been um, a, a nice process of working with local businesses and community uh, neighborhoods to figure out where the, the best spots would be for, for use, use of this program. So we're excited that that started and I think rolling out to the rest of the county later this year, uh, UCSC has it, the city has it, we've got it now and I think there's a Watsonville's coming next, I believe. So uh, next slide, please. One thing that kind of added to our, our scope this last year was the, a lot of storm damage that we took on the 2023 January and December storm. So that map on the top left is just to kind of show all the different spots that we had damaged, both to city infrastructure, critical infrastructure, um, roadways, uh, lots of different things. So that added quite a volume to the Public Works team this year, um, working with FEMA, Cal OES, FHWA, and just our local um, jurisdictions to figure out how to go after some of these things, quantify them, and then slowly and chip away at implementing the repair work. So we've got a picture of one of the slide repairs that we were able to complete um, with the support from um, those, those uh, funding jurisdictions. So that has been something that's currently underway, still underway, and some of the projects were quick to repair and others um, due to the nature and the severity of the damage are going to take a little bit longer to, to get after, but it's, it's been um, good to work with. And I think this highlighted how valuable our uh, 
uh, Public Works Corporation Yard team has been for the city with quickly responding to many of these things to get us back up and running at least uh, enough to make everything function. And then the long-term repairs are turning into things that we're, we're working on collaboratively now. Next slide, please. Uh, from 2024, we try to do an annual pavement maintenance project um, using Measure D, SB1, and general fund dollars. In 2023, that project was the Capitola Road project, which was we highlighted in the slide earlier. And then 2024, we have um, more of an infill with uh, arterial, not, not as many arterials, but more collector and residential streets for surface seals and um, base repairs of, of that nature. These projects have been ones that we worked on our five-year plan and have slowly been able to implement that. So our five-year plan started the year before last, and we're able to attach, uh, attack that first project and then uh, are in the queue to go after the 2024 project with the, uh, the rest of the projects that are highlighted in different colors. And this should be um, well-received and hopefully it's been um, good to see new road work. I think everyone's happy when we're paving potholes and, and updating striping and putting in new curb ramps. And so without the support from Measure D and SB1, I think we would be falling short. So that has been a huge help in our ability to execute more road repair work. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one thing that we have coming up that's underway, I think for a lot of jurisdictions that we've started to implement and looking at how this uh, builds out through the year. So this is more of a into the future project with the assembly bill 413 often referenced as the daylighting implementation where we're that's the intention there is to provide additional pedestrian safety at intersections and crosswalks um, we've started by looking how, at how that impacts our most highly trafficked uh, pedestrian zones here in the village and where we have multiple crosswalks and really high volumes of pedestrians so we're looking at how we need to make use of that and one um, item that we found to be a good use of that space is to use that for our B cycle station. So we actually identified in that top left picture, uh, one of our larger B cycle stations in the village is now located in an area that we knew would have to be eliminated as part of the um, daylighting implementation. So that seems to be a nice fit for how we can make use of that space um, with the loss of parking, but then maybe the addition of, of other um, modes of transportation that can be used in those zones. Uh, next slide, please. Another project that we have upcoming that was we received a, a, a good amount of funding through the RTC's call for projects last year was our 41st Avenue Pavement Rehabilitation and Multimodal Improvement Project. Um, for those of you who's been spending quite a bit of work over the years on 41st, we had, had an adaptive signal program. Um, we're doing a battery backup system this year on that corridor for all those signals. And then looking at the needs along the immediate approach to the bridge deck from um, on the south side from Clare Street and then on the north side from the Home Depot side, um, the, the asphalt in need of lots of repair, the bridge deck needs some work. And then also we've identified that there are often conflicts with the different user groups um, getting onto and, and crossing over this section of the highway where it's a huge arterial street that ends up with lots of volume onto and off of the highway. And with the bike traffic at the same time, we often see lots of people cutting across lanes. And so this uh, project is intended to improve safety, visibility of, of cyclists and pedestrians, as well as still allowing for the same volume and flow of vehicles to get on and off the freeway. So we're looking forward to this project. This is gonna be uh, a little long in the making. We have to go through Caltrans to get encroachment permits to implement some modifications to what we have out there now. So we're starting that now. So design is underway with the hope that we'll have design complete with permitting um, ready for construction next summer. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the last project we wanted to highlight for you today. Um, this is our Cliff Drive Resiliency Planning Project. This is also somewhat um, initiated from the storm damage happening in 2023, where we saw some loss to the bluff there, uh, Cliff Drive. And many of you may use this area for pulling out and enjoying the views of the ocean. This is also a critical road for infrastructure, both for uh, vehicles coming in and out of Capitola, the 
there's large amounts of utility infrastructure under that road. And so we're in the process right now of identifying alternatives for how to um, maintain and secure this roadway, uh, working with both the Coastal Commission and FHWA for funding. And we will, uh, we've started our public outreach process and we'll have uh, additional public outreach. So for those of you that might be interested or know those that might be, um, we have an active page right now on our website showing what we're we're up to so far and then the future outreach that we'd like to get because the more input we get on our projects the better we're able to design um, towards the, the needs of the community so we would we encourage those to keep keep tabs on what's going on here and we'll do our best to to put the outreach out to solicit feedback from the community and that concludes my report. I, I also would like to say thank you to, to Rachel and Luis. It's been a pleasure working with them over the years. I feel like we wouldn't be doing as good a job ourselves if it weren't for the support we get from them. And just working with the RTC um, on their input to, for us from the different tacks, and uh, including the, the Bicycle Tack and the Elderly and Disabled Te Technical Advisor Commission, I think really improves our projects. You know, all of us are really focused on our work and it's nice to have those outside groups to give us a little bit different perspective and and kind of bring additional value to our project so i appreciate working with rtc and um, i'm happy that we have the opportunity today to highlight a few of the projects that we've been able to complete with you thank you questions from the commission yes commissioner McPherson. congratulations on uh, addressing so many issues do you have any idea of uh, the backlog of projects that need to be done on, on your local roads right now? I mean, the cost factor, I mean, if you could do them all today, how much it would take? So, yeah, I think our last pavement management plan, I think identified, I think the 17 million was the total to like, if we did every single road tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, I'm going to take it. Thank you. I'm going to take it to public comment. Is there any public comment in the room? Hi, welcome. Might have to turn it back on. There we go. If you just uh, there's a little thing that says push, and the green light comes on, then you're you're ready to. Okay, is it on? Okay, um, Terry Thomas. I live in Capitola. Um, I'm kind of curious. You've got all these shareable e-bikes, but who provides the training on how to use them? Because if you want us to get on the e-bikes, we need to know how to use them. We need proper training. We need to encourage the kids that already use e-bikes to use them safely and learn how to use hand signals, wear their helmets, things like that. So please let us know where we can get the training to use the e-bikes, otherwise we won't be using them. Thanks. Thank you. I'll come back to you in just a second. Any other public comment in the room? Any public comment online? Uh, Michael Saint. Uh, thank you, Chair Brown. Um, I wasn't going to comment on this, but Kyle Esch did a very nice presentation. I used to live in Capitola, presently in Aptos. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering if either the city or the project managers have ever considered uh, making the Esplanade in Capitola a walking only area. <clears throat> I know present people like to park next to where they're going, but uh, and maybe use the Capitola shuttle or mass transit of some sort to bring people into the, the village um, or increase the bike e-bike presence itself. Just curious if that had ever been discussed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brian Peoples. Hi, it's Brian Peoples from Trail Now. I wasn't going to comment, but my friend Michael Saint, who I really like, really appreciate Michael. But Michael, <clears throat> your organization opposes using the Capitola Trestle as a trail. So how could we have the Esplanade car free? Uh, why don't we start with making the Capitola Trestle into a trail? Again, I think you're a great guy and appreciate your work. Uh, well, not your work, but you as a person. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. All right. Uh, seeing no further comments online, I'll bring it back to the commissioners. Commissioner Rotkin. 
just wanted to point out to the member of the public who spoke about um, bicycle safety. It's, it's a real concern. The commission's addressed it somewhat, but it's going to be a growing concern in the future. And I think the key to what you're asking for is through ecology action. It's the major group in this county that actually does these actual trainings with young people and so forth, and they need funding to do that. So one thing you might look to is when various kinds of bodies, city councils, board of supervisors, and the RTC come to budget time to ask for appropriate, you know, to address those bodies and ask for more appropriations for that. Or I have no connection to that organization, but to ask for, you know, funding for them to be able to carry on more trainings for young people about the safe use of uh, bicycles, and particularly these motorized uh, bicycles. Thank you, Commissioner Rotkin. Any other commissioner comments, questions? Okay, I'll just add um, for the uh, issue of e-bike safety, especially with youth, the Capitola Police Department does go into our schools and provide um, presentations on e-bike safety and helmet use um, to the youth in uh, the school district. And then uh, the B-cycles specifically are meant for 18 and up. They are not meant for, for youth uh, ridership. Uh, however, um, if anyone is interested in learning how to use the B-cycles, and Kailash, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's a QR code or an app, and it, and it provides the information um, on, on the actual bikes. I can't remember if it's a QR code on the bike or if you just download the B-cycle app, um, one, or, one or both, one or both. Okay. Um, what's that? They are not designed for three 12-year-olds, either, you know. Three 12 year olds stacked up in an overcoat looking like one adult. None of, no, they should not be on the B cycle. Um, all right. Any further questions or comments? All right. Thank you so much, Kailash. Uh, for those who are not aware, the Capitola Public Works Department, Kailash, and our, our uh, director, Jessica Khan, everyone who is working in Capitola Public Works are absolute rock stars, and they are getting so much done um, and just incredibly impressive work. Thank you so much for all that you're doing here in the city. Okay, we're going to move right along to uh, item 29, the Zero Emissions Passenger Rail and Trail Project Update, Alignment, Horizontal Clearances, and Right-of-Way Setbacks. And I will turn to Riley, who I believe is joining us online. That's yes. correct. Yep. Thank you, Chair Brown and Commissioners, and good morning. My name is Riley Gerbrandt, staff of um, your commission and project manager of the Zero Emission Passenger Rail and Trail Project. I'm going to attempt here to uh, share the PowerPoint, make sure I get the right screen. Do you guys see the PowerPoint? Um, right. Chair Brown? Yes, we can okay. see it. Yep, I see on the video that it is, it is there. Um, so again, thank you so much. Um, I'm joined by members of the project team today, Mark McLaren and Chris O'Gara, consultants with HDR Engineering who will be assisting me today in providing you with this project update. Um, I believe that Chris O'Gara has joined as a guest and needs to be promoted. So I think he's raised his hand in the, um, in the sidebar there and um, will be promoted by the uh, Krista and our staff. So today the update will review the project team's recent work, developing the conceptual alignment, including recommendations for adopting Typical, typical design sections and development setbacks. The presentation will also summarize ongoing coordination efforts with partner agencies and with project teams that are developing uh, designs for the coastal rail trail segments eight through 12. So just as a refresh, we've got the project um, outline and overview here on the screen. As you know, the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line is a continuous transportation corridor that spans approximately 22 miles from the community of Pajaro in northern Monterey County to Davenport in north of Santa Cruz. The Branch Line Corridor has uh, a unique opportunity for transportation investments to support and improve multimodal transportation options in Santa Cruz County. With this in mind, your commission in 2023 directed staff to complete the project concept report for the zero emission passenger rail and trail project, which aims to provide new high capacity passenger rail service and stations on 22 miles of the branch line 
as well as 12 new miles of coastal rail trail comprising segments 13, 13 through 20, as well as segment 11, phase two. And this is our project schedule, which you've seen before. We're here in the project concept portion, the first phase of the project, which is expected to be completed in spring 2025 and will complete the project concept report. After this phase, we'll lead into the environmental documentation and then a project approval, after which would begin right away and final design, ultimately uh, ending in construction of the project. And so that's just a brief inter, uh, in, intro introduction for the presentation today. I'm going to uh, hand it over to my project team member, Mark McLaren, who will introduce the work that the project team has been doing over the last several weeks and months to develop the conceptual project alignment. So go ahead, Mark. Great. Thank you, Riley. Good morning. Um, I'd like to talk just very briefly about the development of alignments and uh, how that impacts service of a passenger railroad within this corridor and the work that the team uh, has initiated uh, to date. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, the project team is in the process of developing at a conceptual level, both the horizontal and vertical alignments of the railroad through, through the, the corridor. Um, in doing so, we've been reviewing and building upon the work and uh, that was previously done in several segments for the existing trail designs uh, that are underway, as we had spoken briefly about last month, and with the intent of optimizing a design uh, to the greatest extent possible that accommodates both the rail and the trail facilities within the existing right-of-way. In doing so at a conceptual level, uh, we're focused on several assumptions uh, to guide that design with the intent of not being or designing to minimums uh, early in a project, but at the same standpoint, having enough information to develop alignments uh, that set the stage for a consensus decision ultimately on moving a project forward to the next step and also initiating the environmental process. So these are uh, guidelines, if you will, in terms of how we proceed through the conceptual design. Uh, again, with the intent of enabling the ability to have enough sufficient detail to provide adequate information to move into the uh, environmental process with a preferred alternative. Um, it also uh, would allow us, as we have uh, discussed, to look at desired outcomes for both the passenger and the rail facility while maintaining the objectives for both. And doing so, uh, we have a couple of criteria, if you will, that we're working with um, that we'll, we'll be discussing as part of the presentation. Uh, one of those has to do with the speed uh, of a train, and it doesn't intend to mean that we're going to operate at the same speed for the entire length of the line. But in those areas where we have the ability to operate at a little higher speed, it allows us to shorten the travel time between Santa Cruz and Watsonville. And shortening that travel time not only improves the passenger experience and makes the service more attractive, it also uh, reduces or can reduce the cost associated with the number of train sets and things that are required to provide service on a certain headway or the frequency within which you could expect a train at a station to travel either direction uh, along the line. It also uh, is being done with the intent as I mentioned, that we would be designing within the railroad right of way, understanding that there are locations where because of the speed or the geometry of, of the alignment, those speeds may not necessarily be achievable. Uh, again, it's a conceptual speed at this point in the conversation, but also understanding that there will also be constraints in the design that may affect our ability to either operate at that, space, uh, that speed or to have an alignment that achieves that. With that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to my colleague, Chris O'Gara, uh, project engineer working with us on the team to talk through uh, the initial cross sections and the discussion of the alignments. Chris? Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, probably could we go to the next one? Thank you very much. Um, so throughout the process of looking at the alignment, um, conceptually, we've come up with uh, what we would like to call the preferred width typical typical section. 
So this is looking at the right of way um, along the corridor and in locations where we can achieve or, or where there's existing right of way uh, 45 to 50 feet wide. Um, we are proposing a 12 foot trail, which is consistent with uh, the trail groups and consistent with uh, the um, Caltrans um, uh, standards for uh, bike facilities. Um, we also have uh, 12 foot minimum horizontal clearances from the track center line uh, to allow for constructability and other um, uh, track equipment uh, signals and uh, signage. Um, in this section, we are also including uh, surface drainage and ditches um, to account for the, uh, the drainage uh, within the right of way as well as anything that is flowing. Um, uh, from off the right of way and in, into the right of way to convey that off the property. Um, I think we can go to the next slide. Uh, actually, let's go to the this oh a minimum width section. Okay, sorry, I had another slide here. Um, and throughout our our look at um, at the concept. Um, we have uh, come up with what we're calling the uh, minimum width typical section. This is in locations where we have constrained right of way. Uh, we have defined this as, as locations where we're up to 36 feet of right of way width. Um, within this section, we are still accommodating the 12 foot trail. Uh, we have reduced the horizontal clearance from the track center line to uh, fences or, or right, uh, retaining walls down to 11 feet minimum. Um, and we are uh, not accounting for uh, surface drainage. It's accounting for um, drainage to be conveyed through an, an under drain system uh, and then off the property. Uh, all right. Go to the next slide. Um, in areas where we have what we're calling the unconstrained uh, right away or areas that are greater than the uh, 50 foot wide um, right away widths. Uh, we have come up with a cross section where we have the uh, 12 foot trail um, surface drainage. We have 12 foot minimum horizontal clearance from the track center line. We have uh, proposed a uh, maintenance road or at least providing uh, the possibility or potential for a maintenance road. Um, and in the location where the maintenance road is shown in this section, in, in future conditions, when there is additional service or service needs or capacity needs, um, we have the uh, ability to install or construct a uh, siding track or additional tracks uh, within uh, this area. Uh, at that location where the maintenance road, the 12 foot maintenance road is shown in this section. Um, all right, we can go to the next slide. Um, uh, in, in addition, while we're looking through this concept um, related to the minimum width of the typical section, uh, we've come to locations where the right of way is, is greatly constrained. Um, and we are looking at potential design exceptions. I guess when we say design exceptions, it's design exceptions to our minimum typical section um, to accommodate the uh, rail as well as the trail through these constrained locations. Um, design exceptions would be uh, such as um, reducing trail widths or potentially moving the trail outside of the right of way um, along an adjacent street or other locations uh, for short segments to get around these constrained areas and then bringing it right back into the right of way uh, when the right of, uh, right of way opens up and allows for the trail um, uh, to be within the cross section. Uh, and so if design exceptions are not recommended or feasible, uh, we would then be looking at potential right of way acquisitions to accommodate the rail and trail within these constrained locations. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And so uh, throughout this process, we've been actively coordinating with the ongoing trail projects. Um, 
a number of them that are in design um, and potentially going into construction soon. And um, we can go to the next slide, Riley. And so one of the things that we have uh, proposed is, you know, the overall goal of, of this project is to uh, provide a facility that um, uh, uh, allows access for the, the rail and the trail facilities. Um, the overall proposed recommended horizontal clearance of 11 to 12 foot uh, offset from the track center line is different than what is being proposed in uh, the um, trail master plan of eight and a half feet. Um, we re uh, recognize that the eight and a half foot minimum clearance from the trail master plan uh, was based on um, an assumption that there would be freight rail service uh, at two times a week at less than 10 miles an hour. Um, and so our assumption is that uh, you know, for a future passenger rail service that we would need a, a minimum of 11 to 12 feet um, to provide safety, maintenance, um, operations uh, for the, the future um, passenger rail project. And with that, I think we can go to the next slide. Great, thank you, thank you Chris. Um, as we have been progressing uh, through this work, there has been coordination and requests from uh, the municipalities as well as the county in understanding uh, as requests come forward through those jurisdictions for development uh, or activity adjacent to the railroad right of way, uh, what sort of setbacks might be necessary in order to accommodate uh, not only the construction, but ultimately the um, maintenance of the railroad. Um, as we're working through the conceptual alignments and understanding that the right-of-way varies in different sections along the line, uh, we've worked with the staff to put together uh, this cross-section to represent what kind of the clear area that would be needed uh, on either side from the center line of track if we needed access in, in a narrow area to make those improvements. Um, at this point in time, that is, is based under uh, the assumption is shown here of from the center line of track to an adjacent vertical uh, structure, um, 25 feet. And the intent here is, is that depending on what the right of way is, uh, if there is not the room within the right of way to accommodate that activity, then the municipalities and the county would have the information as we work through the alignment of understanding what sort of area might be necessary so that they can have the conversation hopefully to uh, deter any future encroachments or uh, costs that would be associated with this project because of the inability to have an easy access way in and out for construction. Um, again, this is information to provide to the cities and the county for conversations about land use activity adjacent to the right of way and it's purely is just information at this point based on where we are at this stage of conceptual design until there's an alignment that has been established for which we can in fact map out the areas where we need that access uh, to get in and out of the right of way for the construction of the line. Next slide. And with that, um, I will turn this back to Riley. Great, thank you so much, Mark and Chris. So at this point, um, this brings us to the recommended actions for um, that are in the item 29 staff report. And before I review the specific actions for that are in the staff report, I wanted to take a moment to summarize um, the intent of those actions um, and what those, those recommendations would mean today. By taking the recommended actions, the commission would provide direction to the project team by establishing guidelines for how the project team will proceed with the conceptual design. These recommended recommendations will enable the team to develop an alignment for a project that will include sufficient detail to develop, uh, to, to enable the commission to review and advance the, the project through concurrence and should the commission so choose to advance the project into the environmental process. These recommendations will also enable the project team to the extent possible to minimize risks that are associated with the project. And as we proceed 
to final design, the guidance uh, in terms of our design intent will be refined and become more specific as we gain a better understanding of the project. So by taking these uh, recommended actions today, the commission will provide the team the tools that it needs to uh, develop the conceptual alignment um, with as much utility um, for the, the needs of the project to, to move forward. So, so on the next slide, we have the, the actions themselves. Um, so the recommended options are to uh, adopt the typical design sections as guidelines for the branch line. These are the design sections that are provided in figures one through three of the staff report. Um, the project team will continue to analyze the constrained locations of the corridor that may not meet, meet, meet the typical design section guidelines to develop design options that may include implementing design exceptions or identifying areas of right-of-way need for the project. The second recommended action in the report is that the commission adopt as a standard guideline a 25-foot wide setback for the construction of new structures as measured from the center line of the branch line main track at the time of development review or from the established project center line alignment, whichever is closer. And then to coordinate with partner agencies to refine and optimize the Im implementation of the setback standard during the review of specific proposed developments that are adjacent to the branch line. And then I will summarize now the next steps in the, in the project development. We are here um, entering uh, into milestone two of the project in the coming month. We're looking in June to bring back to the commission um, and commence the milestone two project outreach, where we will be providing the conceptual alignment that the project team has developed, as well as um, a review of the different zero emission vehicle types that are being considered for the project. At that point, we'll be um, bring those to the commission and then bringing those to the public for review and, and input and comment. Then in fall, we'll be bring back a refined conceptual alignment that takes into account the comments that are heard during the milestone two outreach, as well as locations for sta uh, stations and labor facilities and maintenance locations. And then uh, beginning in winter of this year and moving into spring of 2025, we'll provide the draft project concept report with preliminary cost estimates um, for review and in consideration by the commission. And that wraps up the presentation for today. Myself and the design team are available for questions, if you, if you guys have any. Great, thank, thank you. you so much. All right, we're gonna bring it to the commission for questions at this time. I will ask that we hold our comments until after public comment and we'll just do questions. Questions, Commissioner Rotkin? Thank you. Um, I'm bringing out my questions. Um, my, one of the, I, I don't want it to appear at May that we're going like, hurry up, make this thing happen in a hurry and stuff. And then when they finally come forward with concrete stuff that allows them to proceed, say, wait, well, wait, you're moving too fast. I got some questions here. We, we're, we, is this really what we have to decide at this point? Um, but I do have um, questions at this level. Earlier studies made the assumption, or it wasn't just an assumption, we came to the conclusion that travel at, uh, ideally at 60 miles an hour, not the whole, everywhere, but in, wherever possible, was sort of necessary to get the times that we really needed to make this happen. I'm wondering to what extent that um, is fixed, and we really know the answer to that. Um, obviously, it needs to be high speed, but the traffic on Highway 1 is moving at five miles an hour, so it, you, could, you don't have to go 60 miles an hour to beat it. Um, and do a lot better. Uh, even the bus on shoulders, you know, if it moves, say, faster than five and goes 10 or 15 or something, it's not going to be 60. Um, so moving at 60 requires these widths that cut back on how wide the uh, trail can be at various places or that, or that will require us to spend money purchasing right-of-way to make the thing wider. So I, I'm interested in the question of, like, how fixed is the 60-mile-an-hour number? I mean, what happens if you were to look at 50 miles an hour as the maximum speed on this, because I think, again, the loading times are probably more of a factor, how long it takes to load them up, than whether between point A and point B you're going 50 or 60. 
Um, and that, those are affected by things like how long, how do you show your ticket or how do you get on or whatever. Um, so that's a question not, as opposed to a view or a comment. To what extent has that been ex examined or could we look at that again or is that, would that be, do we know for sure that we, it's got to go 60 or we're not going to meet our goals or we're close to our goals of what's going on. The second thing I don't understand is about the maintenance road. Um, <clears throat> the, on the East Coast, I may be wrong about this, but I've lived there for a long time. Um, the Amtrak doesn't have a maintenance road. They repair the track in the middle of the night off of the track. The train itself is a repair vehicle can be a repair vehicle. And obviously, if we have enough width for a maintenance road, the, 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 it's, I mean, a I think a 12-foot path is, is adequate, but the question might be, um, do we really need a maintenance? I mean, is the maintenance road really something we need? Or if we have that much extra room, wouldn't we be, be better make the path wider for part of it? Not the whole thing. We can't afford to do that. But Part of it could be wider and there'd be less conflict during that stretch between bicycles and, and pedestrians and so forth, and less cost ultimately. Because if you, I mean, the cost of fix, making it a trail versus maintenance road, I would assume there's a wash there of some kind. Um, and the, those are my questions. Other than that, I have comments. Thank you. Uh, let's see, do we have answers? Yes. Oh, yeah. Sure. We have we have one more. Um, we have similar questions. So maybe let's get through all the questions and then we'll come back. <clears throat> so I think my questions are kind of similar to uh, Commissioner Rockins, but I wanted to see like also um, we set the standard at 60, but obviously it's not going to run 60 through the whole corridor. And if we look at both speed, whether it's 30 miles, 35 or 50, right? I would like to see what that would look like. But also I had a question is um, the size of the vehicle, right? If it's a lighter vehicle, passenger rail, uh, would that also change uh, sort of the cost of this? And, you know, last meeting we talked a lot about added um, value engineering. And I think we can bring down the cost by not having to purchase any more property. That would be great if that's possible. Thank you. Commissioner Brown, did you have a related question? Um, well, it's, yeah, I, I think it is related. Um, it's related. This is the question of Brown. I have those same questions, so thank you. Um, but also um, just wondering about, because it's sort of mentioned in the report, um, that, uh, you know, setback guidelines may, that we establish may interfere with, um, you know, local jurisdictions, uh, you know, zoning, and, um, and in particular, I'm concerned about the state density bonus law and the way that that restricts local jurisdictions from, you know, requiring any setbacks at all. And so I just worry that there's going to be uh, conflict there, as you kind of suggest, there there might be, and and so I'd like to hear more about how you're thinking about that. In addition to the other questions, we can answer that. All right, let's start there. All right, great. So just to summarize, um, I've got five questions that I wrote down. Did my best to to capture them. First was a um, question about the speed and whether or not that is fixed. Secondly, there's a question about the maintenance roads. Basically, do we need it? There's, there's a few iterations to, to that question. Um, thirdly, looking at the speed, um, would we be able to look at it and look at various different speeds for the, the rail line is associated there with, with question one? There's a question about the size of vehicles and would that uh, change the cost of the project? And then lastly, a uh, question about setbacks and may they interfere with uh, the di different jurisdictions and how they are able to employ their um, development review standards and um, how they might interfere or conflict with state, um, state law. So we'll start with um, the one about the question on um, speeds. So um, speeds relates to um, just not only the travel times, but they also relate to in as as we reduce or adjust the travel times 
and the service of the uh, the, the passenger rail service, um, it affects ridership as well. So, um, Mark, can you explain a little bit more about how we're looking at the different design speeds on the corridor and, and how that is um, incorporated into the current process for developing the concept alignment? Sure, be glad to, Riley. So uh, the, the state rail plan identifies and, and initially and building up to uh, service that would be as frequent as a 30 minute uh, headway uh, for rail service in this corridor as a part of the state rail plan. And the headway is defined as if you went to a station, how long would you have to wait uh, or how frequent would the trains be serving that location? Uh, when we look at the length of a line, um, there are two things then that the speed affects. One is, as Riley mentioned, the travel time along the corridor and the travel time that it takes for someone to make that trip is a part of the decision that they make in choosing to use a, a rail line as opposed to driving in that corridor. So uh, clearly there's an, a cause and effect as it relates to the speed and to the ridership that could be estimated to be uh, using the project. And then the second thing is, is that maintaining the service on a certain frequency, uh, depending on the speed of the train impacts how many trains are needed to make that service achievable. And so when we start a project at this stage, again, being conceptual, uh, we try to work with a design speed that allows us in the locations where we can and where it's appropriate uh, to improve the travel speed between stations with the intent of reducing the time it takes from the train to get from one end of the line to the other. Um, I think it was appropriately mentioned by one of the commissioners. This is not to suggest that that is the speed that the train would travel the entire length of the line. Uh, the type of vehicle, the acceleration of that vehicle, the time it takes for a, a train to dwell at a station while people board and alight, those are all things that go into the consideration of this of the discussion. Uh, as does then the speed that can be achieved by the train also. So the intent at this point in being conceptual is to have a speed that doesn't uh, give us too much restriction as we develop service plans with the project to find the best balance between the frequency of service, the speed of the train, and how it affects or offers opportunities for riders. Riley? Great, thanks so much, Mark. Um, and I will just give a little bit of detail too about the, the concept alignment process. At this point, we're looking at putting um, into the existing right away the both rail and trail facilities. Um, and we do adjustments to the alignment where we can to increase the travel speeds and reduce the travel overall travel times. Um, we will then use the the uh, analysis that we're undertaking right now to identify what can we achieve in different areas of the right-of-way given the current right-of-way widths and restrictions. Um, and then we can use that information to look at what is our overall travel time for the project. So hopefully that answered number to question number one about um, speeds. If there's a follow-up question, I can take that later. The second question that we have is re regarding the maintenance road and maintenance facilities. I'm just correctly stated that we can provide maintenance to the rail line from the rail line itself. However, in doing so, there's um, you know caveats to that. In order to provide maintenance for the for the rail line, you would need to take that rail line out of service to provide that maintenance. So no tra no trains would be able to travel during that time. So your service would be interrupted um, as well as um, not only passenger rail service, but freight rail service. So if you're looking to temporarily se separate the two different services um, and maybe do maintenance at night, you would need to take into account freight may be operating at nighttime. Um, so you, you'd be interrupting uh, one or both of those services. Um, and if you were to do the maintenance from the trail, then uh, for you to access the, the corridor through the trail, you would actually be taking the trail out of service. I mean, you may have to uh, implement areas where you can go through the fence or have gates or, or things like that um, to be able to access the, the rail line via the trail. Um, obviously, that can be considered, that can be done, but it comes again with those, those restrictions and caveats. What's beneficial about having width uh, for a maintenance road is you're able to provide maintenance to the rail line during service and during operations. So you're able to bring in 
um, equipment alongside the tracks and do that maintenance without interrupting service. Whereas if you're on the tracks, like you'd be bringing like a high rail system on the tracks themselves and no other train would be able to operate at that time. Um, so that's where we're looking for where we have the, the width and opportunity to do so without impacting either um, the trail or the rail facility uh, to be able to provide a maintenance road. Um, and we, as I mentioned before, regarding um, the speeds, and this is in, in answer to question number three, we are looking at the various different speed options for the rail line. As I mentioned at this point, conceptually, we're looking at what can we achieve in the existing corridor, providing both facilities. Um, and we will be, we have a, a map charts that we're providing um, that identify what we can achieve in those different areas. And then that goes into the next stage of the analysis. Um, there was a fourth question about looking at the different uh, vehicles and whether or not different vehicles do adjust the, and affect the cost of the project. Um, yes, different vehicles do um, have different costs. Um, we will be providing to the commission and to the public in milestone two, the different vehicle types that we have been looking at as a project team, the various pros and cons for the different vehicle types, which do include costs, not only for purchasing and acquiring them, but also um, maintaining those, those vehicles. Um, uh, is there a good secondary market for those types of vehicles that we can use to acquire the vehicles and, and such? Um, then, and then fifth, we have a question regarding the uh, setbacks that may interfere um, with the local jurisdiction's ability to do their development reviews and their development setbacks. Um, I wanted to point off, and then I'm going to hand it off to, to Mark, that um, the recommended action before the commission today would be adopting a, a, a horizontal setback from the rail center line by the commission which would then be useful for um, conversations with the local agencies and, and partner agencies in establishing this is what the RTC believes uh, is necessary for construction and maintenance of this facility with regards to access. And that gives us a, a platform from which to be able to have those discussions with the partner agencies um, in a more effective and productive manner. Mark, can you give us a little bit more um, Sure, Riley. Um, yes, as, as you mentioned, this this conversation was initiated by requests that came to the RTC staff uh, from representatives of the cities as well as the county as they were having conversations uh, with landowners about uh, future use of certain locations and spaces. And what they were asking to do was to have an understanding of the area that might be needed. Uh, for setbacks along the corridor so that as they are in conversations with property owners, they can be transparent about what they know might be necessary for this program. Uh, understanding uh, that at this point, it's with the intent of providing information to landowners to help uh, to the ability that they can deter future encroachments that then might cause added cost to the project and or impacts as it relates to access to the right of way uh, for construction and maintenance. Clearly, uh, at this stage of the process, that's also information that, that to be developed uh, by the team as we go through the alignment to also inform so that we have an understanding when we move into the environmental process of what, what the potential land use impacts are. But at this point, the intent of this setback as it's proposed and as uh, Riley has outlined it is for information to the jurisdictions for them to share when asked the question about what the setbacks might look like in the future adjacent to the right of way. Riley? Great, thank you, Mark. And also a point of clarification by taking the recommended action, the RTC, uh, the commission would not have a be in itself adopting any changes to any codes or, or development review standards. So um, what we would be doing at that point would be able to take that information to the various different partner agencies and jurisdictions who then could review that information and consider for themselves whether or not they believe they should adopt changes to their um, development codes. Um, understanding that, yes, there are restrictions given by different various um, uh, state laws that would uh, override such setbacks um, and not be able to enforce those specific setbacks um, under certain conditions but at least gives the different various agencies the ability to have those conversations with 
um, the development, um, you know, proposed developers or, or property owners and um, outline this is what the, the project would need or, or is expected to need in the future. Thank you. All right, we'll continue our questions. I'm going to go to this side and then I'll circle back around. Uh, and I have some questions at the end as well. Uh, Commissioner Schifrin, did you have questions? Yes, um, mine is kind of a fundamental question. Um, we're being asked to approve uh, sets of guidelines. And my question is, what is the intent of these guidelines? Because I think a lot of, I don't have the technical background to really know what all of this means. My understanding is, and that's going to be my question if my understanding is correct, is that the intent of the guidelines is to meet minimum standards to allow feasible passenger rail service and the rail trail. That's the intent of the guidelines. That's what we want to try to end up with. And so all these guidelines are sort of recognizing what are the minimum standards and in order to meet them, how, how, how can we end up with allowable or feasible passenger rail, if possible, and the rail tra and the trail? So is that, I mean, I, I the, the staff report doesn't really talk about what the purpose of this, you know, the guidelines are. And I think we can forget as we get down into the weeds that there is an overriding intent of moving forward with this study and if I, and that's what I'm asking is the intent to meet the minimum standards in a way that would allow for a feasible as a rail service and a rail trail shall I answer that question right now yeah go ahead thank you the answer is yes that's what I was hoping right. you'd say <laughs> simple question simple answer thank you I like, love, I like that love one. efficiency at the RTC sorry go ahead really I said, I like those types of answers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any other questions on this side? Yes, Commissioner Kona, go ahead. All right, so I just wanted to clarify what you were just saying, Mr. Brandt, which is that the conversations you've had with planning agencies, for example, at the county or city of Capitola, have been limited to date, and by adopting these guidelines, it will give you an opportunity to have more substantive conversations and in turn for our various planning agencies to have the same uh, more substantive conversations with folks interested in actually uh, developing parcels adjacent to uh, to the rail line. Is that right? That is correct. Okay, um, and then you know you did share a photo of that 41st Avenue segment, which I think is one that is particularly constrained. I mean, looking uh, at it just now on Google Maps, it's like it's not not an easy way to acquire additional right of way. I mean, there's buildings on both sides which are of substantial size. Um, do you have a sense of how narrow a trail would need to be in that segment um, in order to fit both the train and the trail? Yes, the um, so in that area that is is one of our most constrained area of the corridor. Um, the in certain areas we can fit um, the minimum width scenario into the corridor from say you know thirty eighth to forty seventh. In, in some areas we are more constrained. Um, and would not be able to fit in that minimum width scenario within the existing right away. So that is air times where we would be able to look at are there design exceptions that we can employ to be able to fit in the, the rail and trail uh, facility. We would be looking at first off looking, um, can we in certain areas minimize what we're putting into that, that corridor to be able to maximize the, the width available for the trail. Um, in some areas, we have various different options that we could look at. We could look at narrowing the trail. We could look at perhaps putting the trail outside of the right of way in certain locations. Um, we could look at um, acquiring right of way where, where possible. I'm going to hand it over to Mark and Chris to see if we know exactly in the like the narrowest spots how narrow of a trail we would need in order to fit in rail and trail together. Mark. Well, I, I'll defer to Chris on that one. I don't think that we're to the point of design of having a definitive cross section, Riley, uh, for the resolution of that. That's part of what we're working through right now. Yeah, 
yes, I agree with Mark. Um, we're still working through that. And so, you know, through our process, we'll come up with what we determine to be a, a minimum um, trail segment that, or trail width that we can achieve in, in some of those areas. Right. I, that, that's sort of my follow on question here is, I mean, we've heard about some safety concerns when we do start to uh, reduce trail width. Is there a minimum allowable trail width that is, you know, still within safety standards? And if so, what is that? I mean, is it is it eight feet? Is it, you know, I mean, five feet, I think, is a typical bike lane. So, uh, you know, even at eight feet, we're starting to get pretty, pretty darn narrow for bidirectional traffic. Correct. Yep. Uh, I think what we would look at first is try and keep the travel way the same. Um, and then maybe there's areas where we can uh, sh uh, narrow the shoulders while still being safe and providing the safety that is required for um, the various trail design guidance. Um, with respect to minimum, I'm going to check with Mark and Chris. Do you guys know with the design guidance that we're working off of if there's a minimum? Uh, I need to go back and confirm, but I think the the acceptable minimum for the trail, Riley, is 10. Um, you're designing, um, when I say that, that's with the shoulders. Um, and you're designing at 12, the eight foot with two paved shoulders, uh, two foot paved shoulder on either side, which is the desirable. So right now that that is our intent, as Chris mentioned, that's what we're trying to design to. Uh, this is one of those locations where we're trying to work through cross sections in terms of how we can minimize the impact to the trail itself, uh, while also maintaining the minimums required for the clear horizontal clearance of the railroad. Okay. Well, uh, look, look forward to seeing the outcome. It does seem, seem like a challenging spot, and it doesn't. And there's not a great uh, diversion really on either side. I mean, you basically would be either diverting to uh, the south on the Nova Drive, a residential street. I'm sure folk, uh, residents there wouldn't be none too happy about a trail going through their neighborhood. And on the north side, um, you know, down 41st, which now all of a sudden you're on a busy street, Jade Street, uh, and then through Topaz, which is you know again a constrained residential neighborhood. So um, anyway, look uh, look forward with. Looking forward with bated breath to the outcome of what happens, particularly along this segment. Thanks. Sure thing. Additional questions? Yeah, Commissioner Peterson. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I have a kind of follow up to that same area. Um, is is it that you can't fit the uh, trail and rail in the same corridor, given the eleven foot horizontal clearance, or if that was smaller, would that make more room? Right, so um, in the most constrained areas of our corridor, we do have very, very limited width. Um, you know, for the most of our corridor, we do have 40 feet or more, but um, going through Capitola, right through, you know, 41st area on, on east and west of there is, is one of our, our more constrained areas. Um, there, with the minimum width, typical section that we provided in the staff report and that we're recommending for adoption, um, that enables us to, um, fit in a design that includes the, um, you know, fencing that would be required to separate the uh, the train from the active transportation users, as well as along the corridor itself um, uh, on either side, as well as some also some structural elements such as retaining walls that may be needed in certain areas to provide great separation. So where we're coming into these constrained width scenarios for the corridor, Obviously, our first thing we're going to do is can we optimize that design further through um, profile changes to the, the vertical profile that would enable us to perhaps get rid of retaining walls or get rid of certain um, structural elements that um, are taking a bit up a bit of that space. Um, secondly, we're also looking at, you know, we'll, we'll go through design with some of these uh, in, into further into design with some of these questions in uh, specific areas unresolved. We'll know that there are conflicts at those areas that at this stage um, in the concept analysis, we won't have the answers to. But as we get through design, we'll be looking at what design exceptions can we employ, what changes can we make that would enable us to uh, fit more into that corridor. And part, part of those um, design changes would be um, lowering uh, did I did you hear say lowering design speeds? 
Oh, sorry. Um, lowering the horizontal clearance. I'm just seeing like the, the oh, previous gotcha. horizontal clearance was 8.5 feet for up to 10 miles per hour, right? So I'm just thinking like if we really slowed down the train during these, you know, one or two areas, could we squeeze it in by going slower, essentially? I understand. So um, with the, 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 the horizontal clearances for passenger rail, for, for uh, transit rail, there, there is not a linear scale or, or different thresholds for horizontal clearances based on design speed. Um, the, 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 the clearance that is required by the CPUC is a minimum no matter what speed you're operating. Um, during design, we will proceed and uh, work with the CPUC during later stages of design to see are there different um, options for providing a, a lower clearance, but it's, it's not going to be based on speeds per se. You can't just linearly reduce speeds from you know, 60 mile an hour to 20 mile an hour and gain some additional horizontal uh, clearance. It, it doesn't uh, work that way with the CPUC. What is the CPUC minimum um, horizontal clearance? Yep. Right. Um, so the, the absolute minimum horizontal clearance um, by the CPUC based on um, you know, the operations of trains in, in California um, is 10 foot horizontal clearance from track center line. So where was that 8.5 coming from before? Did I misunderstand so eight, that? Yeah, 8.5 uh, horizontal clearance. Um, I'm gonna pass that on to Mark who knows a little bit more about um, the CPUC and, and the, the the horizontal clearance requirements that come from that agency. Okay, sure. Uh, glad to, Riley. So um, the general order of the CPUC that uh, provides the definitions for horizontal clearance is a rather outdated document uh, that was based, if you can envision this, on the presumption of a freight train operating with a, a switch person, person who's going to jump off the train and operate the switch, uh, literally hanging off the side of the train as it would go through an area. And so that horizontal clearance is an absolute minimum on a tangent. And I want to be clear about that because it changes when you get into curves. Uh, along a tangent, it was an eight and a half foot clearance. It was for freight operation. Uh, since a number of the railroads over time have uh, either been constructed new and or have uh, added passenger rail uh, in modern times to those operations. The CPUC has set this precedent of requiring a 10-foot offset from the center line of track uh, to any vertical element that's going to interfere with that space in which, again, theoretically, somebody might be hanging off a train. The 10-foot, again, is for a tangent. Uh, it requires that we allow an additional foot on either side when we're going into a curve. And that's for passenger operation and that uh, those offsets are not specific to the speed of the train. The only other element of the design that could affect or make that offset greater uh, would be how sharp a curve is. Uh, to accommodate for the fact that depending on the radius of the curve, the train might hang over uh, from the side of the, the track more so than it would uh, on a, a slower curve, or I'm sorry, a longer curve radius. So the eight and a half is an absolute minimum for freight. The passenger standard that the state of California uses through the CPUC on new projects is 10. Um, and with on a tangent with 11 on a curve and understanding that we need to minimize risk uh, as we go through conceptual design until things such as the locations of switching equipment and equipment for at grade crossings for signal protection and those sorts of things have been identified the industry practice is to design at 12. and so that's what's uh, represented in the, in the report and what was presented to you in the cross sections earlier for that discussion thank you and i just have um one last question um, regarding the uh, maintenance roads, I thought that I had seen a maintenance truck that can both drive on the road and on tracks. Is that a thing, and could that not negate the need for maintenance roads? 
So the question is, do we have an ability with equipment to operate on the maintenance uh, on the road, the, the, the railroad tracks themselves, um, instead of having the, the, those vehicles operate on a maintenance road? So the answer is yes, there are what we call high rail equipment, which have rubber tires um, that can travel on the road. And then they have um, steel wheels that drop down and can operate on the tracks themselves. So yes, we, we can do that in areas and in areas where we do not have enough width for a maintenance road, that's what we would need to use to be able to maintain the tracks. However, as I mentioned before, in doing that, if you're limiting yourselves to maintaining the um, equip the, the, the railroad only from the railroad tracks themselves, you would be needing to take the railroad out of service during that time that maintenance is happening. So by providing for a maintenance road adjacent to the, the railroad tracks, you're doing two things. One, you're enabling, enabling maintenance to occur during operation of the railroad. You don't have to stop trains throughout the railroad in order to do that maintenance. You're not, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark and, and Chris, but if you are operating maintenance equipment on the tracks, you're, you're pretty much taking the entire line out of service when it comes to passenger rail. Um, so by doing it adjacent to the tracks, you, you can have a lot more flexibility with your service um, and providing service to customers and, and residents. Secondly, as Chris mentioned in the presentation, you would also enable um, in the future with the current presented um, design typical section as figure number three, I believe, for the locating of uh, in the future as service may require in, in, in the future, um, a siding track or a secondary track at that location to um, be, able, be able to meet future operational needs of the, of the um, passenger rail service. So I guess my question wasn't um, that because I know we already covered that, but it was more can this maintenance vehicle drive on the track and then pull off to do the work, thereby negating the need for a separate road, which would gotcha. cost a lot of money to develop, right? Yep. Um, generally speaking, the high rail vehicles can only get on and off the track at grade crossings. So you would not be able to say drive to somewhere in the middle of a, uh, between two various different grade crossings, um, pull up those, those, uh, steel wheels and drive off the tracks to do the maintenance. Um, you, you wouldn't have vehicles to be able to do that. Yeah. That was my question. Thank you. Sure. Additional questions. Commissioner Rodkin, did you have another question? Just one. I'm wondering if, if we send out this, this is back to Sandy's question. If we point out to the local jurisdictions that we'd like to have a further setback from development uh, for a variety of reasons, before we really know if we need it, um, are we just automatically setting off a bunch of lawsuits that call early on? I mean, at some point, you may have taking suit, takings lawsuits or inverse condemnation suits, but but the question is, do we, is it really necessary at this point to announce that we're interested in taking X amount of space before we know that we really need it? And wouldn't we be the one setting that stuff off rather than waiting to a time when we really know we do, that we do? If we do, then, you know, you have to face what you have to buy it because it's somebody's right away. But I'm curious whether that's not a, a necessary risk of expenditure early in the process. So. May I uh, answer that, Chair Brown? Yeah, please. I was I was also going to ask if we need to do construction setbacks now, or if we can wait on that part until we're actually getting towards construction. So, I'll add my question with yeah. that. So, um, to answer that question, there, there's two com components that I heard. I'll, I'll re reiterate it just to make sure I understand it correctly. Firstly, um, do we need to establish setbacks today for for um, construction? And secondly, are we opening ourselves up to, to lawsuits and such? Um, regarding the lawsuits, obviously I'm not counsel, so I would defer specific questions to um, the commission counsel regarding the possibility for, for lawsuits. Um, but I wanna reiterate what we're doing today would not be um, establishing any code requirement um, that would have enforceability for setbacks. What we would be doing is establishing as guidance what the commission believes it would need for maintenance and construction of the railroad 
in the future, not only of the passenger rail service, but of existing railroad tracks. What access do we need for the existing uh, tracks to be able to access the right of way for maintenance? Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mark, who uh, we've had some discussions regarding when you you can and can't um, have a, a established area that is required for some sort of project in the future. There is, um, you know, guidelines for that that Mark can speak to. Sure, Riley. Um, I, I guess to to further expand upon uh, that conversation. Um, and understanding is he stated that this is not a uh, specific recommendation that the commission itself be setting a standard for which they're asking the jurisdictions to make that change. Um, this was in response to a request from the jurisdictions as to what information they could share or should be knowledgeable of in dealing with property owners when the question comes up about what might be occurring adjacent to the railroad right of way in the future. Um, Clearly at this point in the process, uh, we cannot map or be more definitive until we've worked through a design and have a design that's agreed upon for the corridor. And then at that point, even before this can, as I understand it again, and would defer to council uh, be codified, uh, it needs to have gone through the environmental process and been, been cleared to the point where the agency has the ability, if necessary, to even go in and make the case to request or suggest uh, uh, or ask for such easements in the future. So the intent here was purely to provide information back with your acknowledgement uh, to the communities so that when they are asked the question about what might be occurring adjacent to the right of way that they need to be aware of in the future, it would be the information that could be shared. Riley? Thank you, Mark. And that way we have, in my doing that and taking the recommended action today, um, before the commission, we would have a consistent um, message that we'd be providing to the, the partner agencies and jurisdictions um, to, that is established by, you know, what we're presenting here today. Thank you. And uh, commissioners, I'll, I'll just add on to that, that the, the concept of identifying areas that might be useful in knowing in terms of establishing setbacks at a subsequent point does not constitute a taking. Um, cities and public agencies often will include uh, requirements and expectations, for instance, in their general plan, and the courts have not found that that level of activity, that level of regulation is itself a taking. Um, the issue that would come up is that if at some point in the future, RTC was constructing something and decided that they really did need to get a greater distance between the between the tracks or the trail and some other thing, and they acquired that. That would be a different issue. That that's what the other speakers have talked about earlier about the, the potential need to acquire some additional property at a later point. Additional questions? All right, I've got a couple. Uh, luckily, several of my questions uh, have already been asked and answered. So, but I will have a, a couple. I guess you'd say like statements that I'm just looking to clarify if I'm understanding correctly. Um, so I uh, had previously planned to ask if we could get a, like a table of vehicle speeds and the associated horizontal clearances that we would need based on the vehicle speed. But um, based on previous questions and the answers we received, it sounds like it doesn't matter what the vehicle speed is. The clearance will always be the same as long as it's passenger or freight, regardless of the speed. Is that correct? That is correct to, to a point. Um, obviously, we are designing for class one, which goes up to 60 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. um, so we're only talking about within that context. Um, and again, freight versus passenger rail does have um, some difference uh, horizontal clearances. But when it comes to the passenger rail service, that is correct. So it wouldn't matter if it was 30 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour, the clearance would be required to be the same. There wouldn't be a lower clearance for a lower speed at certain correct. areas on the rail line. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, unless it was a different class, correct? Yeah, if we're talking about different classes, um, like, you know, high-speed rail, right? That's sure. going to be different, but we're not considering such things. Sure. So maybe that, um, so although we are designing the um, rail line with freight capability um, and, and to freight standards, 
because we are allowing passenger service or planning for passenger service, we would need to design to the stricter 10 foot horizontal clearances rather than the 8.5 horizontal clearances that would be allowable if this was only freight, correct? That is correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, is there, I, I'm wondering about the 12 foot clearances when it looks like we could have, you know, as little as 10. So I'm wondering, is there a benefit to adopting this larger scope of clearance that we may need? Um, and if we approve 12 foot clearances, uh, yeah, 12 foot clearances today, and then we determine that we don't need 12 foot clearances, then we're not gonna build 12 foot clearances, correct? We would go down to 10 wherever appropriate, even though we've approved up to 12 today? So the question I hear is, is if we were to adopt 12 mm -hmm. today, which is what is recommended before you today for, for the preferred width scenario, um, I do refer to the uh, constrained width scenario, it does have 11 feet. Um, and there is a nuance in there about on a curve, it, we do have to account for the additional width that is required uh, due to being on a curve. Um, when we uh, are going through this analysis at this time, establishing a 12 foot design um, recommendation for areas of um, you know, our preferred width scenario and 11 feet for the, the constrained areas, that enables us as the design team to um, effectively go forward and establish what a conceptual alignment does look like and identify the areas where we have potential conflicts that we do need to look more closely at. Um, and um, then as we go through the process, what are those potential solutions? So um, if we were designing today to, to fit both the rail and the trail in on the corridor, if we had the um, preferred width in all areas, we would, we would at this point design to that 12 foot. Obviously, as we go through final design, we would then take a more close look at what we're developing in, uh, in the service um, and what needs we have for that corridor and uh, design that appropriately. Mark, did I answer that question fully or do you, is there something you wanna add? No, I, I think that uh, pretty well summarizes it, Riley. Um, I, I use the analogy, um, if, if I could, that uh, when you think of uh, designing a home and building a home, and when you go ultimately to do construction, there are certain things that because of conditions in the field, um, the ex what it ends up being on the ground is not exactly what it necessarily all the time what a drawing showed uh, because of things that arise in the field. Um, the importance of having some capacity in terms of the additional foot, if you will, at this point, is that as we get into more detailed design and we understand for location of a, a crossing gate or a, a fence post or that sort of thing that may in the field need to shift a few inches uh, in the CPUC world and the certification of the railroad to operate, those few inches can become critically important. Uh, so we need to know that we have just a little bit of flexibility as we proceed in design so that as the design is refined, uh, we can reduce from the 12 feet but we don't find ourselves in a situation where we have to expand beyond it uh, because of something that was unforeseen in the field. And so it's giving us the ability to manage risk until we get to that higher level of design. Okay. Great. Thank you, Mark. Yes, thank you. Krista, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, I just wanna make sure I understand. So if we do get to a point um, where the uh, right of way is constrained and we would need to do a 10 foot horizontal clearance. It's not like someone's gonna say, well, you know, the RTC approved 12 feet, so we need to start acquiring additional land to make sure this is 12. We would just bring it down to 10. So on, on the uh, concept level, yes. Um, so if we um, are, as I mentioned before, when we're going through this process of conceptual alignments, we're, we're using, um, we would be using what the commission approves today if you guys uh, do approve the recommended actions to establish what can we achieve in the existing corridor. And then um, where practic practicable, you know, making adjustments to to the, the alignment to be able to allow what the uh, design typical section shows. Um, but there are going to be areas where that design typical section is, is not achievable. So where those happen, we are going to look at a, ver a range of various different solutions that are possible for that location. And then you know, during the design process, choose whichever one uh, is, is the best option for that area. Okay. And it, and it may be reducing that, uh, you know, the width some 
um, or some other various different uh, solution. All right, thank you. I'm, I'm almost done, I promise. Um, so uh, going to the construction setbacks, if what we're looking at it, um, is 25 feet, I am a little bit concerned because I know that when you come to people in the community and go, yeah, we're going to need 25 feet of construction setbacks, it's just red flags and alarms and, oh my gosh, they're going to take my whole backyard. And so I'm wondering if, if there is an opportunity for us here to um, say wording of up to 25 feet or if there's a minimum amount of setback that we could put in there so that as the communities go out and speak with neighbors, rather than saying, well, the RTC approved up to 25 feet, they could say the RTC might need between five and 25 feet or something along those lines. Is there a minimum that would be appropriate? So there, uh, I'll paint the picture for, for what we're talking about with the, the, the typical um, setback requirement. Um, again, establishing from the center line of a track is, is where that, that, mm -hmm. um, that setback would begin. You know, we talked to partner agencies about whether something from the center line or something from the property line would be more appropriate. Um, at this stage, they believe that something from the center line would be a more appropriate. Um, and as we move forward through, um, you know, just uh, discussions with them and with the project, developing something that is based on a uh, setback from a property, maybe um, something that certain jurisdictions prefer and certain other jurisdictions don't. Um, so it's gonna be kind of case by case um, for different jurisdictions. Um, but we do have one, the, the setback uh, includes the area that the, the, the track is already going to be set back from the property line. And what the setback allows the uh, to happen is to, to provide that access um, where access may not be uh, you know accessible for, from various other areas um, to certain areas of the, 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 uh, the rail corridor to undertake construction that such as things like maybe retaining walls that might be required to support the, the railroad track roadbed in the future. And so um, you're gonna need some width beyond that, say retaining wall or other structure where vehicles are gonna have to get ingress and egress to, uh, to be able to uh, construct that wall. So that's what we're talking about in terms of setbacks. Um, 25 feet is what the, the project team knows that if we establish that, we can achieve what we're we're looking to construct and and envision in the future, and also provide the maintenance for it. Um, Mark, can you elaborate a little bit more? No, I I, I think you summarized that well, uh, Riley, in the discussion. Um, the intent is is that that uh, that access way is for a worst case scenario of where we need to have access in to do work uh, to construct the guideway. And so that 25 foot from the center line assumes that it gives us work for equipment that would be immediately adjacent to the to the guideway for doing that works stationary equipment at, at times, as well as a travel way adjacent to it for equipment to get in and out of the right of way. Um, if we are in locations uh, where the center line of the track is more than 25 feet from the right of way line, there will be no need. Uh, for any type of temporary uh, space outside of the right of way to do that. But in those locations that are in particularly those that are narrow, uh, where in, in order to accommodate the rail and the trail most appropriately with the objective of both projects within the right of way, we don't have, excuse me, we don't have that full 25 feet. It would then be easy to get an understanding of how much space we would need outside the right of way for that temporary access. Thank you, Mark. And I think, Kristen, if we were to say, uh, you know, change the the recommended recommendation or, or what the commission adopts today to something of up to 25 feet, it would um, it would constrain us a little bit and would provide a little bit of a challenge to the, the partner agencies in having those conversations. Because then the question is, well, what is the minimum that you do need? Um, and again, that depends on what we're trying to achieve at a specific location. Um, with 25 feet, we know that we can construct basically anything that, that we're, we're looking at constructing on the rail line um, and also provide that maintenance access. Um, I think we could change to up to 25 feet, but I think it does limit us and make the conversations um, 
a little bit more confusing with the, the partner agencies and then with the you know the developers or, or property owners that they'd be talking to themselves um, because we would then have this more of a, a, a vague requirement um, in terms of what would be required. And, and we just don't have the level of detail right now of establishing specifically what we need to construct at a specific location um, to be able to adjust the, uh, the right of way um, uh, setback requirement for that specific area. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. You mentioned that class one is 60 miles an hour. Um, you know, I, I've had the opportunity to ride on different modes of transportation along the rail line from the Christmas train, the Coast Futura, Roaring Camp, the Daisy train, and a weird little Caltrans truck train. And, you know, none of them went over 26. I think the Christmas train went 26, but it felt like you're on a big boat, kind of. It was bouncing. Um, the passenger one, I think, went 17, the fastest I saw it go on the speedometer. Uh, what class level would be something under 60, something that, like, um, Commissioner Rocket was talking about, 50 miles an hour? So um, I'm going to have Mark chime in for the uh, the different classes of the railroads. Well, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I honestly cannot, from the top of my head, uh, provide verification for you in terms of where the break point is in the classifications. Um, again, that uh, consideration of speed, uh, while yes, may affect uh, the travel time and some other things related to the design as it relates to the clearance and the setbacks, uh, that speed for passenger service um, is not going to affect uh, that setback as it's determined by the CPUC because it's it's specific to the fact that it is passenger operation with a frequent and scheduled service. Thank you, Mark. Well, speed doesn't matter, basically. Is that what I'm hearing? Not for that type of service. Correct. All right. Yes, Commissioner Quinn. I just have a couple questions. And I'm going to start by saying these questions are in the spirit of trying to move this forward. You know, I was told I was an obstructionist last week, and I just want to clarify that since I've been on the commission, there's been 29 rail votes. I voted yes on 26. I'm not obstructing. I'm looking for clarity. I think when we bring these issues to the public, there's so much hype in the media and so much misinformation. We owe the public very clear direction on what it's going to mean for them. And I'm going to go back to the last visit when the two, the last meeting when the two proposals through Capitola were outlined. Proposal one, over the trestle, requires rail banking. Proposal two, through the village, against Measure L. How does the public decide when they're given options like that? So I applaud the clarity of this. It's very clear. I uh, push back against any compromise on what's being called out. Up to 25 feet is going to lead to a world of interpretations and misunderstanding of what that means. I think we should go with 12 feet and 25 feet, and the public need to fully appreciate what a project of this scale is going to mean to them in their backyard and in their neighborhood. And if we can't create a clear picture of what this is going to mean for everyone in our community, if we keep retreating to visionary pictures of fast trains quietly, seamlessly going through a neighborhood that isn't theirs, we're misleading the public. So I totally applaud this approach. I think the numbers are right. And we owe it to the public to deliver a very clear vision of what this project is going to mean for them. Okay. <laughs> Any further questions? All right. Uh, with that, we will now bring this to public comment. We'll start with public comment in the room. If you'd like to give comment on this item, please line up at the podium. Uh, thanks very much. My name is Barry Scott, and I live in uh, Aptos. Um, looking at the Transit Corridor Alternatives an Analysis uh, Draft Business Plan, uh, several vehicles were mentioned. I have uh, come to understand that the numbers that we're getting are relating to something fairly large vehicle, a uh, light rail vehicle. This is a Stadler um, but included in the, and, and it requires, let me explain, it requires so much space for a number of reasons. A high road bed, because the floor boarding height is at two feet or better. Uh, so you need wider space. These at 60 miles an hour need banked curves. It's just a ridiculously large train. 
But the transit corridor alternatives analysis included the TIGM, it included a Bombardier option. These are light, low floor boarding rail vehicles that do not, I'm fairly certain, need 10 feet. They don't need 10 feet, they don't need 12 feet. They operate at a level that would permit real easy platforms like eight inches off the ground instead of throughout our city, giant two foot high, four foot high uh, thing. So what I would ask is that the, uh, you know, perhaps accept the recommendations with the stipulation or continue this until we have more information that includes the lighter vehicles. We brought the TIGM train here. It, it operated in this corridor. It had CPUC uh, 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 permissions. It had FRA permissions and it was listed as a candidate this type, and I'm not promoting TIGM per se, but there are clearly vehicles that are available that don't need these ridiculously large setbacks. And I'm asking that somebody make a motion to direct the, the design team to, to reconnect and consider, let's have a range. Let's see a table of this kind of train and that kind of train so that we maximize the possibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Uh, Terry Thomas again. Uh, regarding the setback conflicts in Capitola, when bikers and pedestrians get to Monterey Avenue, you can avoid all the negative impacts of minimal space along the Park Avenue stretch and Escalona Gulch Monarch Butterfly Habitat by using the existing Park Avenue bike lanes and sidewalks to Coronado. It would eliminate the need for the 12 foot elevated platform retaining wall structure to accommodate the trail. The Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Master Plan says that using existing streets that maximize views of Monterey Bay are allowed. The track there is below grade and provides no views and an elevated trail would seem too dangerous and inaccessible, not to mention an impediment to the remaining wildlife there. This would also save trees along the corridor, so I ask you to take this solution into your design considerations. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners, alternates, and staff. I'm solid in sale. I live in Santa Cruz. First, I want to thank RTC staff for their heroic efforts in concert with county staff to address the concerns of Supervisors Koenig and McPherson, leading to Tuesday's unanimous board approval of segments 10 and 11. We are now well on our way towards construction of a contiguous trail next to the tracks all the way from Davenport to Aptos. Secondly, I'd like to make a comment uh, on today's report to the commission the report states to provide the average travel times discussed in the study, passenger rail service needs to be capable of achieving speeds of at least 30 miles per hour and up to 60 miles per hour where feasible along the branch line while coexisting with a multi-use trail along the branch right of way. I'd like to suggest that the travel times discussed in the study not be taken as writ in stone but instead weighed against the costs of achieving them versus the costs for several alternatives with reasonable but slightly longer travel times. Rather than locking in on, quote, travel times need to be as short as possible, I suggest the goal be as short as practicable. Costs should be developed for operations at speeds below 30 miles per hour in certain densely populated or otherwise constrained areas while allowing for operations up to 65.9 miles per hour in open farmland south of La Selva Beach. The system that's right for Santa Cruz County should not be a cookie cutter clone of what's right for another region. I would welcome a built train with lower speeds in the north that provides service to Watsonville over a speedier design that remains on the drawing boards because of cost. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jacob Waisaki. I live in Live Oak here, so I'm represented District 1. Um, and I'd actually really like to thank the staff for the uh, presentation they gave. I think they answered a lot of questions that I had walking into this. Um, uh, this morning, I was reading through CPUC general orders, trying to make sense of where 12 feet came from, 
uh, 10 feet. It's nice to hear that that's actually the minimum. It was interesting, um, I found a uh, report from the FRA and the US Department of Transportation, and they cite the Inland Rail Trail in San Diego County, California, uh, which has a seven foot setback along a rail corridor with up to 70 trains per day traveling 60 miles per hour. Um, so I think what I'd like to sort of focus on is that we actually have a little bit of leeway here. And uh, I appreciate the answer to the question that just because we adopt 12 feet today, that doesn't mean that that's fixed in stone. Um, it seems that the CPUC has some flexibility to move things back where necessary. Um, it's good to have a design with lots of margin. I'm an electrical engineer. And always when we're putting different blocks together, uh, we always start by asking for the most that we can get and certainly 12 feet, um, that would be great. But where it's, where it's appropriate, we can dial that back. And um, so I think given that, I can support uh, the staff rec recommendation today. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi. <laughs> my name is Johanna Lighthill. Thank you, commissioners, for considering my comments today. And thanks to staff and HER for their presentation. Um, I appreciate them explaining about the setbacks because that's something that's been on my mind for a long time. Um, I think what they did is uh, provide a lot of conceptual planning information, but what I would like to have addressed is how these setbacks affect the current trail that has been completed and is in under uh, development. Uh, the general understanding that the ultimate, the reason for the ultimate trail to be built is to um, accommodate passenger rail, but the trail planners thus far using an eight, eight and a half setback from Santa Cruz all the way to um, Aptos, it's the entire portion of the corridor is eight and a half feet from the center of the tracks. So I would like to discuss the consequences of this planning discrepancy um, from the whole entire over eight, eight miles, either one, reduced trail widths are inevitable, or moving the tracks away from the trail, or acquiring additional right-of-way, and they all sound expensive. Um, I urge the commission to um, consult with the CPUC before approving these setbacks, because obviously not consulting with the CPUC has led us to this discrepancy, and uh, I don't think we can afford to be wrong on that. Um, the CPUC, um, should uh, preferably in writing approve the 12 foot and the 11 foot recommended setback is said to believe uh, based on beliefs and assumptions. And I don't think we can afford that either. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hello, uh, my name is Peter Newton. I'm from Santa Cruz, um, cyclist and um, been here for about 20 years. I want to thank the commissioners and uh, HDR and staff for a great job. I'm a designer and I like to hear about, you know, all the inputs that you could possibly have on a project. And it's great to see this level of detail being put out to the public. So um, my comment today is about um, the maintenance roads. And um, as Commissioner Schifrin said, this, the purpose of this study is to create minimal standards. And to me, that means uh, saving as much money as possible so that we can have this thing, thing actually built, have electric transit built, um, hopefully in my lifetime and all of ours. Um, I'm not a rail expert, but I have ridden Caltrain a number of times. And uh, one thing that I've noticed is if you shut down um, a rail track or if you do maintenance on a rail track, you have to shut the whole track down. Caltrain will go from trains traveling in either direction on two rails, two sets of rails to um, traveling one way, essentially setting up a one-way road. So any maintenance that's being done on a track means that it has to be shut down either way. So my question is, do we really need this maintenance road? Um, could we not do the maintenance from the trail itself? Yes, possibly we'd have to shut down um, the trail temporarily, um, but I believe that any major maintenance is gonna happen to the rail is gonna to have to be done from the rail itself with high rail equipment. So thanks very much and uh, appreciate all your great work. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi thank, hi, thank you. Thank you for everyone being here. 
Um, don't plan to buy more right away just so that a train can run faster. Design a system for the corridor we have. If the width of the row doesn't allow for a bigger setback because the width of the right of way is less, direct HDR to design cross sections for lower speeds and if necessary, slightly reduced trail width. Small right of way purchases for important stations or passing sidings are a different matter than designing a system that requires a wider corridor overall. Also was mentioned today, they've meant, you folks have mentioned the California State Rail Plan. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the Pajaro Watsonville uh, uh, transit, transit Hub is located right, no, right south of Watsonville. Watsonville is 1.5 miles from the Pajaro train station that will be connected to Salinas and to rest of the uh, uh, rest of the California State Rail Plan. So please remember that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi, my name is Joan. Um, uh, don't over-engineer this project. Um, exclude extraneous features such as the maintenance road and the 60 mile per hour capacity from your base design assumptions. Nice to have features should be included as a, included as optional add-on packages to keep the basic costs low. We don't want to make this project more expensive than necessary. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Sally Arnold, and I really appreciate the thoughtful questions and answers that have clarified some concerns that a lot of people in the community have. Um, and I think that um, it's going to be very important to be clear about where exactly do you think 60 miles an hour is going to happen? Um, I can't imagine it's anywhere except possibly between like La Selva and Watsonville. And um, I think that to, and, and if my assumption is correct, uh, then, you know, you need to make that clear because people are going to be very frightened about, you know, 60 mile an hour train, like, you know, accelerating and decelerating between, I don't know, 7th and 17th Avenue in a very densely populated area. You know, I think we need to be, um, a lot of the assumptions here, you know, that people have talked about, like, you know, well, you'll plan for the most you can possibly get and then maybe reduce it. But it's, it's causing alarm and it needs to be clarified. Um, and the... And I think what some other people said about, like, let's not over-engineer this. You know, there's all kinds of bells and whistles that can be added to a project that are just going to make it expensive to build. And, um, you know, people have already talked to not necessary for that speed, not necessary for the maintenance road. You know, there's a lot of things that can be dialed back here. And I hope people will consider that. The, um, and last of all, um, you know, in places where there's so many stops, particularly in North County, dwell time is going to be way more important than the speed of the train. So, um, you know, let's look at all the ways that dwell time can be improved with level boarding, multiple doors per train, uh, fare checking before they get on, not once, you know, not at the door. There's a lot of ways you can move things along quickly and that will make a bigger chance to impact on travel time because nobody wants a 60 mile an hour train in high dense areas. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment in the room? Seeing none, we'll go to those online. It looks like we have three, four people with their hands raised. We'll start at the top with Ben Vernaza. Okay, yes, first I just talk about uh, the girdle just got two feet smaller because in September of 2023, the rules were changed and now you need 14 feet <clears throat> excuse me, with 10 feet usable space uh, between object, objective. And so that's 1003-1, apostrophe three. Now, back to my presentation, play by the book. First of all, uh, safety on the election. Safety, repair por portals, children's safety, repave streets. And lastly, it says in bike lanes, bike trails, preserve rail options, which I think is rail banking. Then uh, section 24 uh, says that any amendments to expenditure has to be two thirds. And what are the uh, allocations? Cities and counties, 30%, highways 25, 
Metro 20, Monterey Bay, Scenic 17, rail corridor studies, 8%. Now, uh, it also says the measure, the measure of revenues do not include funding for any new train rail service. If the, if the Transportation Commission determines the best use of the corridor is other than trail, the funds may be used for other transportation improvements. And there's, uh, that means the oversight committee is gonna be busy. And let me tell you, the auditors now have to uh, undertake no clear, which is non-compliance with laws and regulations and put it in their footnotes. So <clears throat> um, if you don't do the ultimate trail, it'll end up with 25%, which can be used around the trails for potholes and so forth. Plus part of the 17% with a two thirds vote can go to other things and the interim trail can be can be finished in two and two and a half years. But I think your four feet limitation now that you thought you are two feet mean, means that's even worse. Thank you for your comments. So better, check, better check that out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Michael Saint. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair Brown. Um, I hope the RTC uh, will keep an open mind and sometime in the future focus on alternative technology that reduces cost and eliminates the need to change alignment and not have to replace trestles and bridges due to the weight of a lighter train system and just upgrade those trestles. I know this rail right away is supposed to handle freight but what if that requirement can be eliminated? A much smaller and lighter passenger moving technology may eliminate a lot of the issues that you're having with a larger train and what it is causing. A smaller passenger service technology could possibly allow a wider trail or a split trail, which would separate bikes and pedestrians. Tra there is technology that has also uh, allowed fare box to cover operating costs and maintenance. Also mentioned earlier was a 30 minute headway. And I think that's unacceptable for any type of mass transit service. Metro had 30 minute headways and <clears throat> it did not attract ridership. Uh, and one of my questions is wondering if a PRT type zero emissions vehicle be one of the types studied in your next uh, time coming up. I'd also like to ask you to please think outside the box when you go to future transportation technology. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan Peoples. Hi, this is uh, Brian Peoples with Trail Now. So this should not come as a surprise. We've been telling you this for 10 years that you weren't meeting setback requirements. So we're a little confused and frustrated why it's coming now. I thought we hired an engineering firm here that would have understood that. So that when you do your design, you're supposed to know your requirements, your design requirements right off. Um, so not sure if you're looking at the other assumptions. What about the Coastal Commission? Maybe you should be looking at the Coastal Commission, the idea of 60 trains a day going along Park Avenue on the cliffs, the vibration that's going to occur the Coastal Commission will not approve um, new sea level rising requirements. Also, the beach access requirements. You're going to have these new walls that's going to prevent people from seeing, being able to get to the beach. So I'm asking you to step it up on the, on the other assumptions. What about Roaring Camp in front of the boardwalk? How are they going to park their train there? If you got a train going by every 15 minutes, yeah, it's every 15 minutes because one direction and the other direction. So it's a little frustrating that you're doing design work and you don't have your total uh, assumptions done. I'm an engineer. I would have been fired if I had done a design this way. We're far along on the trail. Now the biggest concern is if you approve a new setback requirements, that is going to impact your CDC grant that you just approved yesterday for the ultimate trail. Your ultimate trail will violate, be violating those new setback requirements. So that's gonna be a concern and you can sure assume that we will be communicating with the CTC administration about that violation. So you should not change setback requirements 
continue moving forward with your design of a train. And if you if it pencils out, then good. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Uh, we have Faina Segal. Good afternoon. Um, I wanted to, to thank the staff for answering all these many questions and really say I understand, you know, trying to put the cart for the horse and come up with general um, assumptions that can be used to help design the trail. Um, but we do have to work in our very unique corridor that was handed to us. And so I would love to see the constrained cross section at the actual minimum um, from the CPUC. So whether that's 10 feet or 8.6, um, which is what we were able to find or seven that San Diego is using, um, that's what actually fits in our constrained quarter. And so I'd love to see the actual official constrained cross section, um, you know, be, have as, as small as possible so that we can fit everything in the right of way that we do have. Um, and then uh, I would also love to see uh, something that fit more um, spaces for crossing, uh, I'm sorry, for passing sightings. Um, it seems to me like in the places where a corridor is 40 feet, you actually could fit a passing sighting and instead we have drainage ditch ditches. Um, and so I would like to see a little bit more creativity um, in those areas so that we have more space for more passing sightings and also opportunity to have uh, more frequency and headways uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment online? Seeing none, I will bring it back to the commission for I'll further. Staff recommendation. All right, we have a motion and a second for discussion. I think Commissioner Montesino, did you have your hand up? Yeah. You know, um, one of the things I've heard from commissioners and, and also the public like we're um, the seem to me that we're prioritizing the the trail and forgetting about the rail. And you know, whether it's six, uh, 60 miles per hour or whatever the speed is, um, uh, the, both quarters are, are uh, you know, a priority. And putting one against the other you know, uh, doesn't do a, uh, do us any favors. So you know, uh, fighting o over you know the width, the 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 speed. You know, uh, uh, I assume um, that's where we got the consultants to give us that information. Um, I, you know, I, and they're during the darn hardest where they commissioned that. Uh, um, like I said, that we're we're fighting over uh, semantics. So, uh, like I said, I'll be in favor of this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have additional comments, Commissioner Schiffer? Well, others had their hand up first. Okay. Like yes, Commissioner Hernandez and then Commissioner Brown. So, you know, I, I, I want to say that I um, heard some of the comments, right? And I heard, you know, even uh, Commissioner Quinn's comments. And it really is a come to terms kind of uh, decision we're making, uh, the scope and magnitude of, of you know, this vote, right? And I heard some of the, the comments about trail size and setbacks from commissioners Koenig and Peterson in that uh, Capitola area. And so, you know, it, it is of a, a vote of big magnitude. And so I, I would want to see if there would be like a friendly amendment where it doesn't change this vote. It, we were still going to vote on it. But if we can get a report at some point from staff about uh, smaller vehicle, lighter vehicles that we we're talking about, like the TIG M, the Bombardier that goes, you know, under 50 miles. Well, my understanding is that that's going to happen. That's what I thought, too. I think, and, you know, I think this is a frustrating process because it's going to go on for another year at least. And, you know, there are going to be other opportunities for us to have to sort of make decisions. But ultimately, as I remember the, the RFP, we're going to get an analysis of all of these issues, including various kinds of technology. 
I don't think we need a separate st staff report for that. Uh, staff can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that's going to be part of what we're going to get. And what we're doing here is simply um, approving some guidelines, some parameters that will be looked at to try to respond to what the standards are at the same time provide for um, uh, a potentially feasible rail and trail along the corridor, given the crazy right-of-way that we have, which has so many different aspects to it and is going to be difficult to, to really make it all work. But I think that's what at least some of us are shooting for, and um, I think that's what I'm hoping this process would at least tell us what is going to be done and what's, what, what can be done and how we can do it and what we can't do. I agree. Um, staff, do we are we are going to look at that with our consultants as well? Yes. So next, uh, yes, next milestone, we will be presenting um, our review of vehicle um, types. So the initial review and providing uh, the commission and the public with um, pros and cons on the different vehicle types, what they are, what their you know specific parameters are, things of that nature. And then the, the project concept report at the end will culminate with, you know, uh, summarizing the review and um, the project um, from uh, beginning to end. Thank you. I, and thank you. I, I'll be supporting the motion. If I could just really quickly, because it's related. So there were, um, it was mentioned in public comment that a smaller vehicle might not require the same setbacks. And it sounds like we are going to get updates on on what kind of vehicles we might be using but for today's discussion i think it's important to clarify will any smaller vehicles not require the same 10-foot minimum setback so any of the vehicles that are That's regulated good. by the cpuc which are the ones that we're considering in the in the um, project concept report have the same setback requirements or the uh, horizontal clearance requirements okay and i'm sorry to interrupt um comments right now from commissioners but can you do you have any idea um about the comments about the suggestion that some other areas have a seven or eight foot setback for their passenger rail. Um, Mark, are you still on the line to be able to provide comment on that? Sure, and and I don't know the specific uh, location that was being referenced uh, previously. I think that one of the areas I'd need to understand and provide some specific example to, um, knowing that location, I could. However, I think there's also sometimes uh, some misinterpretation in that there are places where there are light rail or streetcar operations that are not operating in a line used for freight uh, that are complying with different requirements. And, and in this case, because this is a corridor that operates uh, with freight traffic is what brings it under the jurisdiction of the Federal Railroad Administration. And that's where then the CPUC is the state organization required uh, to provide the certification for safety for operation. So, um, I'd be glad to see if there are exceptions to that, but my understanding of places where a rail operation may have a narrower clearance, it's in a case where it is not operating within an FRA corridor. Thank you, Thank you Mark. I appreciate that. Uh, Commissioner Brown. I actually was going to ask those questions as a follow-up rather than making comments, but um, I, so I, it sounds like any of the potential, the vehicle types that are going to be coming to us uh, at our next meeting will require the kind of same assumptions re with respect to the, the clearance and setbacks. Um, that, I just want to make sure that, that I'm clear about that. So and any, anything that is compatible with freight would require us to engineer up to a 60 mile per hour speed. Is that what I want to make sure I'm clear um, about 60 that. Minute, 60 mile an hour per speed is, is a different question. So that's um, you know, going up to, to class one. So, um, okay. Speed. Sorry, but I was kind of conflating. Clearances, yeah, clearances are going to be the, the same the, uh, with any of the vehicles that we're going to be presenting be to the commission or the public. Okay. Any passenger vehicle that is compatible with freight will require the same thing. That's, that's any, any vehicle okay. that we're going to be presenting for this study, yes. Um, you know, I want to be careful in the nuance there. Compatible with freight means something different. Um, it's just that because we have freight operating and passenger rail operating on the same rail line, and we're limited 
um, with the, the requirements from the CPUC. Okay. Um, I think I understand. The question I was going to ask is why aren't we considering vehicle type uh, alongside these decisions? Um, but if it doesn't matter, then I guess <laughs> then, then uh, that question is answered as well. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just say I do have concerns. There's several concerns I have, and I think some of the members of the public spoke to this about you know us making assumptions and uh, providing direction that that is going to lead to a wild speculation about what this means for people living along the rail line. And I do think we need to be very responsive to those concerns. And you know, and I you know I think. Um, Commissioner Quinn, your point about what you know what's happening on the on the ground, um, and and the, the the impacts that has on real people's lives is, is critical, and so uh, you know I I want to try to uh, move through this in a way that does not create those um, you know like just you know fear moving through neighborhoods um, when that's when when we ha aren't even making those kinds of decisions right now. And so, yeah, I guess I'm just really concerned about the potential for displacement. I think we need to be um, clear about what trade-offs we're willing to make in order to, you know, not pursue uh, a route that ends up leading us down a takings road. I mean, though, I just can't imagine what it would be like for our staff, for this commission, for our community to be, um, you know, pursuing that because this is what we're told we must do um, if that, you know, and, and I just don't have enough expertise to determine whether that's the case or not. I'm still confused about the need to engineer to 60 miles per hour for something that we know is, is unlikely to ever reach those speeds. I mean, if you've been on that rail line, um, it, it's, I, but I, I will trust our consultants in that regard for, and our staff, um, but I still am confused about it. Um, and I think the public is going to be as well. So I think we need to be really clear in our communications with the public about what this means. Um, it took us a while, or it took me a while, <laughs> sitting here today to get clear about that or clearer. Um, we don't have that opportunity. Not everybody gets to sit here and work through it, right? So please let's, um, you know, figure out how we're going to um, engage with the public as we move through this. Um, and then I also want to say, I just have to say this, um, we hear every single meeting, um, we could have a trail right now and countless commissioners have responded to this. We could have a trail right now if we just abandon all of this. There is no universe in which uh, we will be competitive for funding. There are no grant opportunities to just build a Cadillac trail uh, on a rail corridor. We will not get it funded. So we know we could not have it today, even if we left aside the rail banking question and the likelihood of that being challenged. We will never get a Cadillac trail funded without uh, inclusion of uh, a, a rail option. So, it, you know, it just people are going to keep saying it and we're going to keep responding. <laughs> Those of us who just want to call out, that out, it's just not the case. Um, we have to move through these steps in order to um, get a trail. Um, we may never get a rail if, you know, depending on what the studies tell us, but we, we have to move through these steps to get a trail at all. So I know that's not going to stop people from continuing to assert uh, the a contradictory view, but I'm going to keep saying it here. Um, thank you. I'm prepared to support the motion and uh, just wanted to share those concerns. Commissioner Johnson, then uh, Commissioner Rotkin. Thank you, Chair. So it's, it's interesting that as we move from um, general, train is good and it's going to be the best thing, uh, to specifics, and I think somebody used the term in, into the weeds, and you know the devils are in the details. I think one of the reasons why 60 miles an hour is being uh, promoted is that that's what the expectation is out there, that this is going to be efficient, it's going to uh, faster speeds mean uh, uh, reliability, travel time, higher ridership. Um, but now you're hearing just a lot of equivocation of, oh, maybe slower is better, okay? Maybe maybe the setbacks don't don't need to be uh, uh, what what 
experts are saying they probably should be. And so, you know, what happens, of course, and maybe people don't really pay attention to ridership, but it is the backbone of any transportation system, I think Metro is finding that out, is that you get a ridership death spiral, right? Because Instead of taking 35 minutes, maybe it takes an hour and five minutes, and pretty soon people leave, lose confidence in the reliability of a train, they stop using it, and, and there you are. So I would, instead of, you know, um, less is more and slower is better or whatever, that's not what people are expecting from this train. Um, it's, I don't think it's been advertised as a commuter uh, uh, system, but it is a passenger, and passengers are what drive it, and backing away from that and, and making it uh, less and equivocating, uh, I don't think it serves anybody's purposes. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Rockton. About an hour and a half ago, Andy Schifrin asked a question about the guidelines and to what extent they were sort of locked into place and um, going to you know, <coughs> force us for example, to abandon part of the trail because you know, due to minimum guidelines and so forth. And so I think I got a pretty clear assurance from staff and from our consultants that um, guidelines are guidelines. You need some to start someplace if you're going to sort of plan a, a route, a train route and a, a, a trail next to it. You've got to start off with certain kinds of assumptions about how fast things are moving and what are the setbacks that are generally recommended or required, and then sometimes apparently exceptions get made. And I have confidence, the reason I'm going to vote for this motion is that I have confidence at this point that, you know, if we were to discover that um, 60 miles an hour turns out to be a fatal flaw of the train project, and whereas 55 miles an hour would make it work, I don't think our staff's going to tell us the train's dead because we, because we couldn't meet the 60 mile an hour uh, speed. I think Randy's point's well taken that you know, we're not going to like design this in a way that it ends up being a little, you know, sort of moving, slugging along, uh, you know, choo-choo. But it, it needs to be moved, you know, ra ra rather rapidly and get people where they need to go. But I, I think where the staff is starting this investigation is the proper place to go. And then as they, as we discover constraints, adjustments will have to be made. And some of those adjustments may be very difficult: the purchase of additional land, which is expensive. Or taking people off of the trail for two blocks or whatever. I mean, those are not things I would look forward to, but that could happen. Um, you, what you can do is have a break in the train. It's got to have to stay on one track and, and, you know, run the whole way. But I'm confident that our staff understands that these are guidelines we're beginning with. It allows you to do some design work, to figure out where the constraints really are, where are you going to have some problems. So the, I, I, I'm confident that if we vote for this motion that we're not going to get stuck in that or we're asking too much in the standards and it's going to kill the project or make it infeasible. I, I don't think that's the case. I just wanted to make one other comment. In this meeting and lots of other meetings, people get up and they go, oh, this would be just so simple if we got rid of the freight, you know, and we just, we just had like, you know, a passenger thing and like, how about that TIG, TIG M thing? It's just, you know. Build it on the track now. We can get this thing up in a hurry and make everything else happen. The only thing that would happen if we got rid of the freight is we wouldn't have a corridor anymore. I mean, people it's hard for people to grasp that. You don't need to actually build out the total thing at freight. Every bridge doesn't have to get finished and be done. But as soon as you signal a clear intent that we're giving up on freight, that, it's, that this is not going to be potentially uh, accessible to freight service, you are going to be sued so quickly by property owners looking for pieces of the, the back. It's, whether it's 12% or 25%, there's debates about how much we don't own that we only have a, 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 an easement on. But the reason we're stuck with freight is because that's how we got the quarter. That's what allows us to make these decisions about it. And I know that's difficult for the public to sometimes understand, especially because we're not, I mean, and people will say, well, where's this freight coming from? Where's all this? You know, I don't know that there's any freight service coming, but you've got a plan for the potential of it where you lose the corridor, and I think that's a factual thing. And then the people say, well, there's the possibility of rail banking, and Sandy already spoke to that, but I mean, I don't think we're going there as a solution to this. I think we have to keep proceeding on the basis that we're planning to have freight and passenger service on this rail line, and, you know, again, move towards it. And the first time that we look like we're faltering on that or we're going to give up the freight because the train, because the passenger would be so much cheaper and quicker and easier and lighter and stuff, 
we're dead. We won't have a quarter anymore and we'll have nothing, not even the, the trail, because the trail depends on a quarter that we own and we may not own all of it. Thank you. Commissioner uh, Koenig and then Commissioner Schifrin and then I have some final comments and then we'll vote. I'll be extremely brief, but with all due respect, Commissioner Rockin, that is a false understanding of rail banking. Okay. And, and I'm, I, our staff could clarify that for you offline, but the reality is rail banking, which is by definition given up on the freight, uh, the whole point is to preserve the line. So I'm sure staff can clarify that for you offline. I wanted to respond to the comments of uh, Commissioner Brown about the um, public concern, which was also brought up uh, in terms of how fast the train is going to go. And I mean, my understanding is that there are places where high speed may be feasible, and there are lots of places where high speed won't be feasible for a variety of reasons. But you brought up an important point, which is public outreach. And so um, I think people can get confused. It is confusing. Uh, it is a step along the process. So I wanted to ask staff, uh, what is the public outreach that's going to occur through this process so that there will be community meetings where the realities can be separated from the fantasies? Hi, Sarah Christensen. Riley had to um, drop off, so I'm going to answer on his behalf. So uh, the question is about public outreach and the plan for that. Milestone two is um, to look at the vehicle types and the alignments. And we've already tentatively scheduled two meetings, one in Santa Cruz, one in Watsonville. And the meetings, we plan to have boards with kind of high-level information on them. But then we also plan to have roll plots available of the entire corridor. It's an incredible amount of work that our consultants have been doing, and um, we're in the process of reviewing them now. So a lot of information is coming in June, and um, kind of our strategy or our approach to this project is because this is such a large project, it really warrants uh, quite a bit of education to the community, to the commission, and, and honestly to staff as well of what this project really entails. And so that's our approach is um, in June, we're going to be providing a comprehensive set of information, um, you know, two dimensional, at least, I think profiles as well. So lay out, lay out some profiles of the alignment of the rail line and then the remaining uh, alignment of the trails as well. Thank you. I wish I could believe that um, that will allay all the public fears, but um, based on past experience, um, at least we're providing the opportunity to do that. So thank you. All right, I'm just going to be really brief in some final comments, and then we'll go to a vote. So um, I initially shared a lot of the concerns that have been brought up here today, and uh, the idea that we would be designing to 12-foot clearances in areas where we could just have or could need um, to, to design to 10, but a lot of the questions that were asked by my fellow commissioners and the information given uh, today in the staff presentation has suppressed some of those concerns for me. Um, not every report will answer every question. I think that's something that I've learned over my time at the RTC, that, that we get uh, updates and reports, and there's still more questions, and there's more updates and reports to receive that hopefully will answer those. Um, I would appreciate the opportunity to hear in the future more about where the speeds are expected at which part in the rail line, if we're expecting 60 miles, where we're expecting 60, where we could expect to see 25, where we might expect to see 10. Um, I think that will be uh, good information to have as we move forward and answer questions in the community, uh, knowing that we're not engineering based on speed, that that speed won't change the clearances, the vehicle won't change the clearances, but just knowing I think will be helpful. I would feel more comfortable with providing residents with construction setback information from our property line rather than from the rail center line because I think that property line is easier for um, residents to wrap their head around. I don't think that requires an amendment, but if, if, that's, if it's possible to have that information shared um, with local jurisdictions so that they can share both sets of information with uh, property owners and residents that we might need, you know, a 25 feet of setback from uh, the center line. And if we could just determine what's, you know, where the most constrained area is from the property line that we might need additional. I don't know if that's possible, but if it is, and that's something staff could look into and just let us know if that's possible, I'd really appreciate it. 
My Chair Brown, Sarah Christensen again. So we actually did have that exact discussion with all of the planning departments, um, Santa Cruz, Capitola, Watsonville, and County. And uh, their preference was from Centerline. And that's because um, one example was, you know, the west side of Santa Cruz where the corridor is very wide. They wouldn't want to have setbacks even further back. So um, that was kind of why we landed on the 25 foot from center line. It's going to maximize the developability of um, adjacent parcels. Okay. And we have to balance it with, you know, transit oriented development. We obviously want development along the rail line um, and, you know, the needs of the project. Thank you. All right. Uh, with that, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, with that, our next RTC meeting is scheduled for June, uh, excuse me, Thursday, June 6th at, 20, uh, at 9 a.m. at the Watsonville City Council Chambers. Uh, our next transportation policy workshop, are we still expecting to have that? Potentially? Uh, we hope not, but potentially uh, on Thursday, May 16th, uh, to be determined if that happens. Until then, um, thank you all for being here. Please take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and we're adjourned. <laughs>